or in some cases your stands. The Committee on Oversight and Government Reform will come to order. The Committee meets today to consider H.R. 3029, the Reducing the Size of the Federal Government Through Attrition Act of 2011, H.R. 3289, the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act of 2011, H.R. 3262, the Government Results Transparency Act, H.R. 3237, the SOAR Technical Corrections Act, H.R. 2297, to promote the development of Southwest Waterfront in the District of Columbia and for other purposes, and several postal naming bills. I would now recognize the Ranking Member. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, if, if I may, I would like to have a colloquy with you uh, about the Presidential Record. The gentleman is recognized. Today's business meeting was supposed to include consideration of H.R. 3071, the Presidential Record Act's amendments, um, that this bill is not being considered today for various reasons that uh, we are uh, continuing to address. Yesterday, a coalition of 32 organizations sent a letter to the committee endorsing the bill. The groups wrote that they, and I quote, strongly support passage of H.R. 3071, end of quote. I ask unanimous consent to include that letter in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Chairman, when we discussed this earlier this week, uh, you gave me your commitment that H.R. 3071 will be considered at the next full committee business meeting on November 17th, and that, and that uh, will be, regardless of any additional objections that might arise between now and then, uh, will you confirm that, is my understanding? If the gentleman would yield? Yes. The gentleman is absolutely correct. Uh, because of some last-minute uh, concerns by, uh, by groups that had not previously weighed in, uh, you and I had the, uh, uh, the conversation. I believe that uh, giving an additional short period for those concerns to be heard, and if any small technical corrections are necessary, we will work on those. But you have my commitment. This is a bill that has passed the House previously. It is very bipartisan. You and I are both strong supporters of getting it done. And you have my commitment. It will be marked up at the next business meeting. Just one other uh, issue, uh, Mr. Chairman, if, if I may. I would like to ask a question about today's agenda. Last week I wrote a letter requesting that you issue subpoenas to the Federal housing regulators to obtain, to obtain so-called engagement letters between mortgage banks and the consultants they hired to review their past foreclosure abuses. As I said in my letter, the regulators issued a report last April finding, and I quote, critical weaknesses, end of quote, and widespread risks with 14 mortgage servicers. They also found illegal foreclosures against United States service members. As part of the enforcement action, the banks were ordered to sign their engagement letters with private consultants to examine their past actions more comprehensively. I requested copies of the letters in May because uh, there were questions about why the banks were allowed to propose their own terms for those reviews, including the methodologies and sampling methods. Last week, I asked for the subpoenas uh, because the regulators made clear that they cannot, by law, turn over these engagement letters unless they are compelled to do so through a subpoena. As you know, the committee voted unanimously on February 10 to investigate it, to investigate, quote, wrongful foreclosures and other abuses by mortgage servicing companies, end of quote. Obtaining these engagement letters will, um, will directly fulfill our commitments respons committee's responsibilities. To date, um, you have not uh, responded to my letter and you have not issued the subpoenas. And I would like to ask whether you intend to issue the subpoenas, if so, when, and if not, why not. And I do understand from your staff that um, we have gotten some response saying that they would issue redacted letters by Thanksgiving, um, but the redactions are the very things that we are most concerned about. The gentleman would yield. Yes, certainly. Uh, I join with the gentleman in the concern that we need to have uh, timely disclosure. Because the OCC has indicated that they are going to release a substantial amount of what we have asked for before Thanksgiving, uh, I believe it is appropriate for us to allow them that relatively short time to issue it. Uh, we will be asking that they provide us at least a briefing of pertinent information that may be redacted once we see it. Additionally, I do reserve the right to subpoena documents if we feel that the disclosure is not sufficient. As to the uh, servicemen uh, mistakes, which you and I have, have worked hard on and, and no need to be resolved, 
I would like to inform the ranking member that we continue to look at it. Uh, we have a new concern, which is that in spite of all this work, we find that uh, DOJ is currently withholding permission for many of the banks to release the monies that they agree to pay, even though they are willing to release the monies to these individuals, and they are relatively small amounts, but they are significant enough to, to one is significant if you are the recipient, and we are working as we speak to encourage that release to occur so that it, uh, at least those who the banks are prepared to make substantial payments to immediately, none of them are they asking for a full and complete release. They simply say, we agree, we owe them this amount, we would like to be able to give it to them. Uh, so we are working to try to have that released. And we, uh, we would hope that if, uh, if we are unable to get voluntary compliance, that, uh, that you and I would join together in insisting that if a bank agrees that they have wronged a service member and they have the money reserved and prepared to pay, that no government agency should slow that process down. I am in agreement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. As we begin to, commit, uh, to consider H.R. Uh, 3029, I would note for the record of all the members on both sides of the, uh, uh, the dais here that we are considering a lot of numbers that begin with 3,000. This is not an accident. This is the result of something that I believe this committee should be proud of. Every one of these bills, even if not in its final form, reflects months and virtually a whole year of thoughtful negotiation. Members who had previously delivered legislation worked together to try to have what we believe will be as close to consensus on the major bills today. I look forward to uh, the amendment process where appropriate. And I want to thank the ranking member, because not only under his leadership, but all of his uh, subcommittee rankings have worked cooperatively to try to give us the best language we can so that although we do not come to the committee with unanimity, we do for an unusual time, we do come with a degree of uh, preparation where the process was open, even though in one or more cases there has not been a hearing. In one or more cases, a bill uh, that previously passed will be different and was delayed by more than a year. Lastly, I would like to uh, thank the watchdog groups who have uh, weighed in steadily, have been patient as uh, a new Congress has tried to uh, get it right so that when it leaves this committee, it will be, uh, these bills will be bills that we, in fact, can push hard to make sure go through both the House and the Senate. It is now appropriate for the committee to consider House Resolution 3029, the Reducing the Size of Federal Government Through Attrition Act of 2011. Without objection, I discharge the Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce, United States Postal Service, and Labor Policy from consideration of House Resolution 3029, and I recognize myself for an opening statement. The legislation before the committee today is similar to the one introduced earlier this year, along with Subcommittee Chairman uh, Ross and Budget Committee Member Chaffetz. We introduced the bill to carry out the assumptions uh, in the House Budget Resolution. I urge my colleagues to support the bill and, uh, that we have before the committee today. And I would note, uh, as will be noted by anyone else that strikes the last word, this bill, if in fact the President sees fit to waive would reduce zero, I repeat, zero numbers within the Federal workforce. There are sufficient protections for the President in every case of every attrition to replace 100 percent of the workforce if for safety, national security, or other reasons he wants to. This does, however, set a numeric goal and ask that those waivers or other uh, uh, carve-outs be done in an open and transparent way. I believe that is where this bill is different than others who simply mandate a number and leave no discretion for national security or other administration prerogatives. Lastly, I would note, and I think this is the one that we should be self-deprecating uh, uh, on, Congress can at any time act to create a new agency or new positions. If we create new positions and do not reflect the Attrition Act, those positions will be net additional. 
So although we go in a direction today, it is a modest direction because ultimately it requires the discipline of the administration and the Congress not to retain or create positions. Uh, and I ask the unanimous consent that mine uh, and any other person's opening statements be placed in the record. And skip ahead to, I now recognize Mr. Cumming to make, Cummings to make an opening statement overall. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I strongly oppose H.R. 3029, which would require a reduction of 10 percent of the Federal workforce by 2015. This legislation is identical to legislation previously introduced by the Chairman and would impose a one for three hiring ratio across all agencies. That means agencies could hire only one new worker to replace every three workers who leave Federal service. The majority has held no hearings to examine how implementation of this measure would impact the provision of Federal services to our Nation. Despite assertions to the contrary, the Federal workforce has decreased significantly since the 1960s when measured in terms of the number of workers per capita. According to OMB, in 1962, there were 13.3 executive branch employees for every 1,000 Americans. As of 2010, there were 8.4, uh, the lowest level in 50 years. Cutting the workforce does not diminish the demand for taxpayer services. The proposed indiscriminate cuts will increase the more costly contractor workforce and reduce the efficiency and effectiveness of services for taxpayers. Uh, Max Steyer, the CEO of the Nonpartisan Partnership for Public Service, has said this about it, quote, history has shown that government-wide hiring freezes result in neither a smaller nor a more effective government, indeed, downsizing the Federal workforce without strategic workforce planning will result in skill gaps and increased reliance on contractors and ultimately a government that is less efficient and effective than the American people deserve, end of quote. Similarly, John Gravois, the editor of the Washington Monthly, has said the following, and I quote, in practice, cutting civil servants often means uh, either adding private contractors or in areas where the uh, government plays a regulatory function, resorting to the belief that industries have a deep capacity to police themselves, end of quote. Uh, Gravis also uh, documents how reducing the number of Defense uh, Department officials in half in the 1990s from 460,000 to 230,000 resulted in a greater number of contractors. Uh, as he notes, at roughly the same time as the defense contract management workforce was being hollowed out, the military was reorganizing itself around a vastly increased dependence on outside contractors. A 2009 GAO report that reviewed 96 major Defense Department acquisition programs found cumulative cost overruns of nearly $300 billion in fiscal uh, year 2009 dollars, 2009 dollars. In addition, 42 percent of the programs reviewed by the GAO experienced cost overruns of 25 percent or more, and the average delay in completing an acquisition was 22 months. GAO noted that many of the programs it reviewed reported degradation in oversight, uh, delays in certain management and contracting activities, increased workloads for existing uh, staff, and reliance on support contractors to fill some voids. We all depend on uh, the work uh, that Federal employees do each day. They provide for our national security. They ensure the safety of the food we eat. They care for our veterans. They test new medicines for safety and efficiency. Uh, and they ensure the uh, safety of nuclear power plants in our nation. The legislation before us fails to recognize this reality. Instead of making thoughtful cuts and allowing us to tailor the size of the Federal workforce to our nation's needs, this legislation prescribes rigid reductions in force and prioritizes compliance uh, with cuts uh, over continuity of service. I urge the members to reject the legislation. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. We will now, uh, uh, so we will now open the bill, H.R. 3029, for consideration. Without objection, H.R. 3029 will be considered as read and open for amendments at any point. The text has already been distributed to each uh, of, of you in your folders. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 3029, a bill to reduce the size of the Federal workforce through attrition and for other purposes. Does any member wish? The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Ross. 
You know, Dennis, at some point we've got to get you over to the other side. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Gentlemen, is recognized. Thank you. Um, last December, the White House's Deficit Commission outlined a plan of action to address our nation's fiscal woes. Included in the report was a recommendation to reduce the, si reduce the size of the Federal workforce by over 200,000. The House budget resolution adopted a similar policy in assuming a 10 percent uh, uh, reduction via attrition in the size of the Federal workforce. White House officials have repeatedly stated that they would implement many of the Commission's ideas, but they did not incorporate a Federal workforce reduction proposal into the President's February budget release or recently in his um, issued deficit reduction plan. In fact, the President's budget, while acknowledging that the Federal workforce has actually grown by 325,000 since President Obama took office, requests an additional 15,000 new Federal workers for the fiscal year 2012. The size of the Federal workforce now stands at 2.2 million, the largest Federal workforce in modern history. At the same time, our economy has lost over 4 million private sector jobs and the unemployment rate hovers around 9 percent. According to OPM, the average pay and benefits of a Federal employee in 2010 was $101,751, a rate of compensation this Nation can no longer afford. Members of this committee appreciate the talented Federal workforce that we have and the critically essential services they provide. However, the current size of the Federal workforce is physically, fiscally unsustainable. Congress has an obligation to consider all policy reforms that halt the sprawl of government and force agency heads to make government more efficient. At a time when our economy is in a recession and budget deficits are at, a stagger, at staggering record levels, taxpayers can no longer be asked to foot the bill for a bloated Federal workforce. H.R. 3029 will help right-size the Federal workforce, and I urge my colleagues to support it. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Does anyone else wish to speak on the bill? The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say that uh, if we are going to try to find ways to reduce the budget deficits, it is important that we make cuts in a deliberate, a smart, and strategic way. Uh, and that if not implemented carefully, these cuts could have a widespread and detrimental impact on uh, the agency's ability to carry out their constitutional and statutory functions and also provide services to the American people. Unfortunately, H.R. 3029, offered by the majority, is neither productive nor strategic. Uh, their solution, a government-wide 10 percent cut to the Federal workforce, may be quick and easy to recite, but it ignores the different priorities and workloads and staffing needs of agency programs. I think it is a bit disingenuous that, that we see this bill going right after Federal employees, and, and the Chairman is correct, it is about 2 million, I am sorry, uh, the subcommittee Chairman is correct, about 2.1 million uh, Federal workers, but we have 10.5 individual contractors, contractors. We don't touch them. We go right after the, ten, the 2 million Federal workers, and we don't, we don't even address the 10.5 private contractors that are on the payroll of this government. And we say we are doing something, but we don't, we don't go after them at all. Also, if you look at the agencies across the government, a number of them have made significant reductions already, uh, 20, 25, 26 percent in the last four years. So what we are saying now is that we, we ignore the cuts that have been made by a lot of those agencies, and we make everybody cut 10 percent in addition to what they have cut already. Some agencies have grown, and they should, they should have to take greater responsibility to reduce their workforce. Others have tried to toe the line, have tried to uh, work with a, a bare-bones staff, and, and they have accomplished reductions, and yet we are asking them on top of those pre-existing cuts to, to cut 10 percent more. I think it is arbitrary. Uh, it doesn't allow the President to, to, uh, to look at the priorities and, and the constitutional mandates that those agencies have and, and cut in a smart, strategic, and deliberate way to, to get, this, get the cost down. So I have got an amendment uh, coming up, and uh, hopefully we will be able to address some of the issues. Would, that are would the gentleman out. yield? I certainly will. Uh, I, I welcome your amendment. As I said, in this process, this is one where we did not get to, by any means, a, a final result. I would like to note, though, in its current form, the bill allows the Office of uh, OMB 
to write the regulations. They are within the provisions of this bill. They could write the regulations so that the 10 percent is government-wide and can be zero from any agency or half of the agencies, and they could achieve the rest of the 10 percent from a relatively small group of agencies. That is over and above the waiver authority that is explicit in the bill. So I, I do want to make sure you understand that although it is ambiguous because we don't order them to do one or the other, our anticipation is that the Office of Management and Budget will give themselves the ability to pick and choose what agencies will achieve 20 percent versus the ones that might achieve zero. Well, l l let me just uh, I, I thank the gentleman, I, I, and I reclaim my time. If you read the bill, it, it established a benchmark in 2011, and then uh, if at some point it is determined that uh, uh, we have not met the, the goal of uh, 10 percent reductions, then uh, there will be an across-the-board freeze, but the calculation is made based on the employment levels within the agency. And, and what I am saying is some agencies have already brought their numbers down, and they don't get credit for that. Uh, the, the other thing is, in the definition of employee uh, under this bill, we don't include the Postal Service. Now, we are working, uh, Republican and Democrat, House and Senate, on a plan to to move 120,000 postal employees into retirement. We don't get any credit for that in this bill. They don't count those employees who, who are going into retirement as a result of the postal bill. So uh, my amendment will, will include those numbers because that actually represents close to a 20 percent reduction in the Postal Service workforce, but it, that is not recognized in this legislation. If the gentleman further yield? Sure. Uh, although the Postal Service, as you and I know, is off budget, uh, it would not bother me a bit to include those numbers and make an appropriate adjustment. Uh, as you say, it, it already would represent about a 10 percent cut in government if we put them into it, uh, based on what we expect them to achieve. Additionally, I share your concern that uh, not only in this bill, but in future bills, we need to address overall efficiency of contractors, not contractor numbers, but number of people for which we pay full-time equivalents. And uh, although that is not addressed in this bill, I would look forward to working with the gentleman on making sure that when we look at overall contractor end strength, that if we are paying for a full-time equivalent, as we are, for example, in Iraq, where our soldiers will come home, but 6,000 contractors will replace them at a greater cost, I believe that this is some, an area in which this committee should work. Uh, to achieve some sort of a protection for the American people. I thank the gentleman. I thank the gentleman. My time has expired. The chair now recognizes the subcommittee uh, chairman uh, from Pennsylvania, Mr. Platts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just uh, would add my words of support for the legislation. Um, I, I think what this legislation is about is, is having the Federal Government match what the, the private sector is already doing. And, and in very difficult financial times, the private sector has had to become a more lean, efficient um, system of operating. And, uh, and that is what we as a Federal Government need to do. And, and I think the point that, that the gentleman from Massachusetts raised is that there are some agencies that have been more dutiful in their um, handling of their personnel and are more important. And, and I think an important part of, of the legislation is that it is 10 percent across the board through attrition, not through layoffs. And that if we exceed that in the future years, there is a hiring freeze until there is a certification by OMB that we are back down under that cap. And so if, if there is an agency that needs more employees, the executive branch, the, the President and OMB and, and his, uh, his staff have the ability to say, listen, you know, we have exceeded it and, and this is a higher priority. We need to get below it and, and in, uh, in doing so, then add more staff here, which is a higher priority. So, I mean, to me, this comes down to prioritization. Uh, of our resources, prioritization of the uh, importance of one department or program versus another. And bottom line is to say to the American people, we understand the message that we can't keep borrowing 40 cents of every dollar and, and having the levels we do, because we can't sustain it. And, and so um, I think the concerns the gentleman raised are, are relevant. Certainly, um, I, I believe that they are addressed by the bill because of, of the flexibility given the executive branch and how it implements the bill. So, um, Would the gentleman yield? Uh, certainly. Yeah, I thank the gentleman. Uh, I, I just offer an example, and I know uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania has been to Iraq 
probably a dozen times in Afghanistan, and, and you work a lot with, uh, with the VA. One of, one of the areas, one of the agencies that, see, that has seen about a 23 percent growth in personnel is the VA system. Now, they have done so because we have a war in Iraq that has been raging and now is, now is scaling down, uh, and we have got a, a, a war raging in, in Afghanistan. We have got young men and women and some not so young men and women coming back with tremendous uh, medical needs. So the VA has responded by, by, by hiring more people and, and especially uh, where we have indicated in the last VA bill to address issues like uh, traumatic brain injury and, and, uh, and PTSD. So they have scaled up to meet the challenge. And what I am concerned about is that instituting an arbitrary cap in the face of that dramatic need, and, and, and those, those men and women in uniform have, have earned those benefits. They have earned it, and they deserve it, and I, don't want to see, I would not like to see uh, an arbitrary cap put on the VA in trying to meet the needs of those, those uh, soldiers coming back. So, you know, it, this, this makes it very difficult, I think, for the, for the VA to address the challenges that, that they are facing because of the the extended amount of, uh, uh, you know, combat time that our, our troops are seeing. And with that, I, I, again, I yield, I yield back. Reclaiming my time, I, I certainly share the gentleman's um, the prioritization of our nation's veterans. I, I would contend that there is no more important responsibility we have than taking care of those who defended our country, defended our freedoms. And, and so we share that. The, I think the, um, the importance of this bill is that this doesn't lessen that commitment. It says that we need to acknowledge that that commitment is a higher priority than some other commitments in other departments, other programs, other agencies and departments. And so to meet the needs, to, um, to, uh, meet the needs of our veterans, uh, we can't just have more employees and spend more money. We've got to say, hey, that's a priority. This is a lesser priority, so we're going to take money and personnel from over here and commit them to veterans, which is the highest priority. And, and so um, I, I think we can meet that obligation, and uh, certainly um, uh, we'll uh, look forward to working with him as well as the Chairman and Ranking Member and, and making sure that that intent of this bill is fulfilled as, um, as it goes forward. So with uh, that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes, uh, well, I, I first heard from the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, if that's all right, and then, then we'll go to the gentleman from Tennessee. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let me just say that I applaud anyone who will try and find a way to bolster our economy, a way to get us out of the economic crisis that we face. However, I am just not certain, and I don't know what is sacrosanct about 10 percent, I am not certain of what that number is based upon. And I don't know that it would necessarily meet the needs of every area. And I'm not certain that denying people the opportunity to work is the most effective way of bolstering the economy. Um, I'm not an economist, but I believe that the more people that you have working, the more the spread of resources are and people are moving money around. A person who has got a job goes to the grocery store, and this gives the person at the grocery store an opportunity to work. The person at the grocery store gets an opportunity to go to the barber shop. This gives the barber an opportunity to work. Of course, the barber can go and take his or her children to school and buy milk and all of the rest of the things. So just downsizing, outsourcing and privatizing government workforces, I'm not certain, is absolutely the best way of right-sizing the government. I think these are very serious matters, and they require a great deal of serious attention. I have always been told that there are no simple solutions to very complex problems. And I think that this problem is filled with complexity. It requires a tremendous amount of analysis and study in terms of approach 
and how do we most effectively do it? I think the goals are desirable, but I am not sure that we have put together all of what we need to have in order to get there and still accomplish what we are trying to accomplish. And for those reasons, I would find it necessary to not be in support of this legislation, and I would yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. I thank my good friend. Um, I, I want to echo what uh, Mr. Davis uh, just said. Uh, I am not even sure. I don't know what the intention is other than to downsize the size of the Federal Government. Inherent in that goal is a value judgment that somehow the size of the Federal Government currently is a bad thing. I don't know that that is true. And by the way, I don't know any successful private corporation that arbitrarily says our workforce will be X and never any bigger. Uh, you know, the workforce grows to meet the, the demands uh, in the private sector, as it should reasonably in the public sector. And we are squeezing missions. We are forcing agencies to uh, actually deprioritize their own individual missions uh, in order to meet this new global goal. Uh, we, it doesn't take into account uh, new missions that may be ascribed uh, to uh, various Federal agencies. And quite frankly, the waiver, the, exec the exception uh, in order to be granted is one of the highest thresholds ever to be met. Uh, and uh, irrespective of the individual missions of Federal agencies. So I think arbitrary caps, whether they be on Federal employees or private contractors, are wrong. I think it is uh, in some ways a substitute for our actually taking out the scalpel and making qualitative judgments about individual missions uh, and the discretionary uh, assignment of particular parts of Federal agencies uh, and substituting it with an arbitrary global number that has no real basis in reality in terms of either the mission, the level of demand, the caseload, uh, or other demands being put on that Federal agency by us legislatively. So I join my friend, Mr. Davis, and the Ranking Member uh, in expressing my opposition to this legislation on those grounds, and I yield back to my friend from Illinois. Thank the gentleman. I now recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am worried that what we have here today is business as usual. If you look at the substance of the issue, I think both sides of the aisle make sense. But we are about to have a polarized party line vote on this, which is a shame. I hope I am wrong in that prediction, but we could and should do a lot better job with this. Um, my colleagues make excellent points about this is basically a one-size-fits-all solution. Now, I know that we give considerable discretion to OMB, to the executive branch, to make adjustments. But remember that we are a co-equal branch of government. We could be making the decisions that my friend Mr. Connolly just described to evaluate priorities, to make greater cuts in one area than in another. One of our failings is not only our inability to acknowledge our role in government as a co-equal branch, but also the fact that because we work a two or three day week here and then take every third week off, we are really not around enough to even visit agencies and really to know where the specific cuts should be made. I added it up last year, and I was only in Washington 90 days. You know, is that enough time to govern the greatest country in the world? I would like to have been around more, but you know, we have other priorities. So it is very important that we focus on what we are doing here. A 10 percent cut sounds great for press release. Uh, an across-the-board approach absolves us of responsibility because we turn over the details to the executive branch that we are so often critical of. I would suggest that a more moderate approach and one that received bipartisan support was found in the Bowles Simpson Commission, where they suggested that a 5 percent approach made more sense. And that is what I intend to offer in an amendment coming up. That Bowles Simpson approach embodied a $4 trillion reduction in our deficits and debt, $4 trillion. And they used a balanced approach that attracted support from senators like Tom Coburn of Oklahoma, extremely conservative, and also more moderate members like Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois. So 
rather than suggest cuts that in all probability are too deep and that the legislative world is not taking very seriously. If you look at the audience before us today, there must be very few people in Washington who think what we are doing is real. Maybe they are watching on C-SPAN, but it looks like this is just an exercise in political futility. So I would suggest that we get real, we adopt the bull simpson level of cuts, um, and that we consider in the future shouldering congressional responsibility more seriously and not considering any across-the-board approach, but trying to prioritize ourselves because we are a co-equal branch of government. I thank the Chair. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman yields back. We now recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Meehan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I thank the, the gentleman from Tennessee for his observations. And I do know that I, I believe he says that with, uh, with uh, you know, a complete sense of how best to approach this. I would ask one thing, and that, that, that he not, as, as some others do, uh, give credence to the idea that somehow when we are not here in Washington, we are otherwise not working. Uh, you know, this, this idea that every third week somehow we are off. I know my colleagues, many who I speak to, who keep exhaustive schedules back in their districts would not consider that to be time off. Uh, but, but, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, I did want to take a moment to discuss this issue with respect to a particular aspect of our Federal workforce. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 3029, offered by Mr. Meehan of Pennsylvania. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the essence of this is to strike a certain language uh, that would, in effect, create the ability for law enforcement personnel uh, to not have to be treated uh, in the same manner as uh, all other uh, Federal employees. I do not say this out of any disrespect for the work that is done across the board by Federal employees who I think uh, most, if not all, come and, and give the best that they can. But I think it is the unique mission of the, the law enforcement challenge uh, in and of itself. I mean, I certainly we all appreciate that that is among Federal employees the one group that, in effect, runs into danger uh, when the rest of us leave. But it is really more, I think, the fact that we have identified that the uh, growth in where there is any growth related to Federal law enforcement is often very much mission specific. I mean, they come and they identify a budget that they have each year. There are priorities which are identified from my experience as a United States attorney working with many of the uh, agencies, from the FBI to DEA to uh, ATF uh, and all of their associated agencies that are covered under uh, Section 84017. The unique mission of law enforcement in terms of public safety is created in a way to match the challenge and the need of public safety. In addition, there is training that is associated and the necessity for the workers to be able to work as units for those who work in concert with other kinds of, uh, on, on a specific mission th that may be related to a particular challenge at the moment. Uh, th when we are talking about Federal law enforcement, it is a unique environment. Uh, many of the individuals have to go through extensive background checks and extensive training before they are even enabled to be out there uh, on the line protecting all of us. And so for that reason, among many, I would like to, I wanted to have us consider the concept of striking the language that would include Federal law enforcement personnel uh, in these provisions. It does not mean that they should be immune from appropriate oversight and justification, but that budget that they must justify each year is the basis upon which we should be deciding uh, the size of the law enforcement uh, personnel. Let me just make one last comment as well from the gentleman from Massachusetts uh, observations, I do appreciate the need for us to be dealing with uh, the 
budgets that we have at this moment and the need to be responsible uh, with our dollars. Uh, but I do speak in agreement with his recognition of the many soldiers and other military personnel that we expect to be returning from overseas with traumatic stress, with substance abuse. I just met this week with individuals. We do not appreciate that one in five of our, law of our personnel from overseas who are in military duty are returning with, with issues, uh, and many of them substance abuse related. We do have a responsibility with our VA as well. Would the gentleman yield? Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, would the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to express my strong support for the gentleman's amendment, which I believe would also attract support from many of the members on this side of the aisle. Federal law enforcement officers play a critical role in protecting our nation's citizens from criminals and terrorists, forcing a 10 percent cut in that workforce, a workforce that is already facing severe budgetary pressures who inevitably threaten safety and the lives of innocent Americans. While I know the gentleman is inclined to withdraw the amendment, I would ask that he seriously uh, consider offering it, and I would urge members to support it. With that, I yield back to the gentleman. Would the gentleman further yield? Yes, I will further yield. Uh, although I, I would appreciate your uh, withdrawing this amendment at this time, I will pledge to you to uh, work together to put language into the bill that expresses the specific concern you just had that, in fact, uh, because of the nature of law enforcement, the efficiencies we often look for uh, and achieve in automation and so on may, in fact, be difficult or impossible in some parts of law enforcement. Ultimately, it is boots on the ground in, in a large section of that. And so uh, to the extent that we can find language that still encourages, if you will, the, the bureaucracy that are not part of you boots on the ground that often occurs in law enforcement, and yet uh, send the right message to OMB, I would be happy to work with the gentleman and ensure that it was in a, a uh, manager's amendment. Well, I appreciate that concession, and from I know from uh, members of both sides of the aisle who appreciate the importance of this issue, and so uh, I will withdraw my amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman? The gentleman withdraws. Yeah. The gentleman from Massachusetts is just recognized. On, I just wanted to address the, the, the gentleman's amendment, if I could. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, I, I think the gentleman from Pennsylvania makes you know, a powerful point with his amendment, even though it is his decision to withdraw it. And I, I think the power of his amendment comes from the fact that he is trying to uh, prioritize a, a constitutional obligation, uh, the, federal, the federal law enforcement uh, agencies that he seeks to protect. Uh, have a constitutional obligation to enforce the law. But I just want to build that out a little bit and also remind folks that the Federal Judiciary, which is also subject to cuts in this, in this legislation, the Federal Judiciary also has a, an obligation under the Constitution to adjudicate uh, matters in, in compliance and, and to a degree that respects their constitutional mandate and the legislative branch as well, in which we sit, has, has a constitutional mandate as well. And so I think the gentleman's point is very well taken. I am just saying that it is uh, it's a bit wider than the gentleman suggests. But uh, I think his, his point was made uh, very clearly in, in, in with great articulation. And, and I, I respect the gentleman. I would have supported his amendment, but I certainly understand uh, his decision to withdraw. Thank you. Would the gentleman yield? Certainly. Certainly. I thank my friend from Massachusetts. I just want to echo what he said. I, uh, I, I think Mr. Meehan has identified one of the flaws with the underlying bill. And I guarantee that if we all spent a few hours uh, sort of going over and combing through this bill, all of us could come up with very cogent and compelling arguments for why some other agency or branch of government uh, deserves a special carve out or a special provision for exemption given the sensitivity of their mission. You cited uh, Mr. Lynch of the judicial branch quite correctly. So I, I just think that is the inherent weakness of this arbitrary capping approach to saying uh, we are going to limit uh, the number of employees to X no matter what. Uh, and that is effectively what we are really doing. And I just don't think that is a good management uh, principle. Um, it is not something I have ever seen in the private sector. We, in the private sector, we cut jobs and we create jobs based on demand 
based on the cycles of the economy, based on the viability of the company. But we don't arbitrarily say, Steve Jobs didn't say, gee, Apple's never going to have more than 5,000 employees. Had he done that, Apple wouldn't have been the great success, in fact, it was. He allowed the number of employees to grow with the demand and the cycles of the company. And that's, you know, it seems to me that's what we ought to do. So uh, I, I thank the gentleman from Pennsylvania for offering this amendment because I think it highlights exactly the inherent weakness in this approach uh, to uh, the size of the Federal Government and trying to legislate that rather than trying to uh, better fine tune it. So I yield back to the friend from Massachusetts. Would the gentleman further yield? The gentleman Ma from Massachusetts controls the time. Would the gentleman would, yield? Would, certainly, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I thank the gentleman for yielding. The, the concern that uh, was just raised I, I think is addressed in the bill because there is a cap established once we you know, um, set the level at the, the lower amount. But the, the waiver process is not just for emergencies. The waiver process states the following. This section may be waived with respect to a particular position or category of positions in an agency upon a determination by the President that the efficiency of the agency or the performance of a critical agency mission so requires. So we are saying that we are going to set a, 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 a limit but give the CEO of the company, in this case the, the President, the, the authority to say, you know, to make this assigned, uh, assignment of this agency work, we are going to allow the CEO to waive that or it is a critical mission. But it is not just emergencies. It is you know, for the efficiency of the agency. So I think we are trying to give that authority, that discretion to the CEO. Would, would my friend from Massachusetts? Your time. Yield back. The gentleman from Massachusetts controls the time. Reclaiming my time briefly. Uh, we, we recognize that. I don't take exception to what you just said. What, what I am trying to say is that uh, in certain agencies and departments, there is a constitutional mandate. It is not just a statutory requirement that Congress has come up with to say enforce this law. It is a constitutional mandate. If you reduce the uh, personnel in a constitutionally uh, mandated department uh, that, uh, that protects core constitutional rights for the people that we represent, you create a constitutional crisis when the courts can't function to the degree that they meet their, their constitutional mandate. You create a constitutional crisis. That is not the same with every single agency you know, the alphabet soup of agencies across government. What I am saying, there is a special obligation, and you would hope that we would be able to maintain that, that modicum of, uh, of uh, efficiency and, and uh, you know, effective prosecution of the law, adjudication of the law, and the legislative uh, side of it as well, but that is not necessarily protected under this bill as it is written. That is all I am saying. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman has withdrawn his amendment. Are there any further amendments? The ranking member is recognized for the purpose of offering an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I will ask unanimous consent that the, the amendment uh, The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment to I H.R. 3029 offered by Mr. Cummings of Maryland. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I said in my opening statement, I am concerned that uh, this legislation will impede the ability of the Federal agencies to deliver critical services to the American people. At this time, we have no specific measures of the exact impact on service delivery of cuts to the Federal workforce imposed by this legislation. My amendment would require agencies to report to Congress on which programs or services they would be forced to reduce or terminate as a result of the implementation of this legislation. Agencies would be required to highlight, in particular, any reductions that endanger national security human life, public health, public safety, property, or the environment. In August of this year, OMB Director Jack Lew directed agencies to develop plans and proposals to reduce their 2013 expenditures by 5 to 10 percent from the previous year's budget. As such, many agencies have already had to take a hard look at how uh, they use their resources and determine how to do more with less. These anticipated budget reductions combined with the pay freeze already in place will encourage too many talented employees to leave government. Particularly in these, in these circumstances, the imposition of this bill's hard limit on hiring will strain agencies 
to the point that they simply may be unable to carry out some of their critical functions. My amendment will ensure that if this is the case, we in Congress, and in particular those of us on the committee responsible for overseeing the Federal Government, are aware of, of, of just what is happening. We would have thousands of veterans returning from wars in Iraq and Afghanistan in desperate need of the services they have earned. We have more than 46 million people living in poverty. We have a stunning shortage of essential drugs that threatens the health and even the lives of hospital patients across the nation. If retirees are going to have to wait longer for their Social Security checks, we should know about it. If NIH has to cut back uh, support for cancer research or other critical illnesses uh, as a result of this legislation, we should know about that, too. As it currently stands, this bill makes cuts with the precision of a chainsaw. My amendment will ensure that we make cuts with the precision of a heart surgeon. My amendment would allow us to see exactly what we are sacrificing and ensure that government is working as effectively and efficiently as possible. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The Chair asks unanimous consent that this amendment be suspended without objection so ordered. The, uh, the Chair will now recognize other amendments. Uh, Mr. Cooper is recognized, the gentleman from Tennessee, for the purpose of offering an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. I ask that it be distributed. The clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 3029, offered by Mr. Cooper of Tennessee. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is an extremely simple amendment. It just takes uh, the number 1 on page 3 of the bill and makes it number 2. That would mean that instead of uh, replacing only one out of three workers that are attrited, that we could replace two out of three. This would have a less harmful impact on Federal agencies, it would still achieve the overall goal of uh, trimming Federal payrolls, but it would do that in a more sensitive fashion. It is difficult to amend a bill like this that uses an across-the-board approach. It would be much better to be targeted and surgical, but since we are not able to do that, um, I am trying to minimize the damages here. Uh, so as I say, it is an extremely simple amendment. It is a middle-of-the-road amendment. And as the chairman well knows, there are only two things in the middle road, yellow lines and dead possums. So, I'm Would the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. Uh, although I am not prepared to accept the amendment in its current form, I would commit to work with the gentleman to provide, uh, with appropriate scoring between now and the time this goes to the floor, uh, language which would allow a specific waiver to a number like this, so long as it achieves within the 10-year window. The, the scored goal. Uh, at this time, I am not prepared to know, and it will take a little while for CBO to give us the numbers. I have no inherent objection to the idea of picking another arbitrary number. At the current time, my staff has informed me that we do have a little, quote, a little headroom in the 10-year window, 
but quite frankly, if the gentleman is willing to withdraw his amendment uh, and have it included and agrees that it is based on the ability, the projection to reach within the 10-year window that you and I are bound by, the goal, I would be happy to work with the gentleman on substantially similar language. Well, that sounds like a very fair offer. I ask that the amendment be withdrawn. Without objection, so ordered. Are there other amendments? The gentleman, Mr. Yarmuth, is recognized for, for the purpose of offering an amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 3029, offered by Mr. Yarmuth of Kentucky. The gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as has already been discussed by and brought up by Mr. Lynch and, and discussed also with Mr. Platts, uh, I think that it is <clears throat> imperative that this Congress uh, reaffirm its commitment to our Nation's veterans. This legislation, as currently written, threatens the effectiveness of the agencies millions of our veterans rely on. It would make it harder for them to get the benefits they deserve and what they have earned. Uh, the men and women who fight to protect our country overseas should never have to battle to receive the compensation or services they deserve at home. And that is why my amendment exempts from job cuts the agencies that serve those who have served our Nation. Uh, I think I am probably not alone uh, in the having to and being back actually proud to respond to literally hundreds and hundreds of cases of our veterans who are having their services delayed, in some cases denied unjustifiably. Since I have been in Congress since 2007, my office has handled more than 1,000 cases concerning veterans' issues, and the vast majority of these cases uh, have been results of inadequate staffing in the agencies that are designed to process and, and serve our veterans. As we have already acknowledged here, the caseload for these agencies will increase dramatically over coming years. And I think while there is a waiver provision, I would hate to say to my veterans, we are going to rely on some determination by some future president that uh, these, these cuts are, are not needed. So uh, my <clears throat> amendment is very simple. It just excludes from the calculation all the agencies that deal with veterans services. And um, with that, I reserve the balance of my time. I will yield, sure. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank the gentleman for this um, very thoughtful amendment. And um, this amendment would exempt from the cuts imposed by the legislation and agencies that provide services to veterans. Um, as we wind down the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, it is our duty to honor the service of our Nation's veterans by ensuring that critical services are available and accessible as they return. And I fully support the gentleman's amendment, and I yield back to the gentleman. Um, I thank the ranking member, and uh, I uh, once again urge my colleagues the gentleman to yield? this amendment. I certainly will yield. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Uh, I, I would like to uh, ask unanimous consent that we enter into the record uh, a report by the Congressional Research Service, the Federal Workforce Characteristics and Trends, uh, prepared by Curtis W. Copeland, a specialist in the American national government. Uh, he notes that uh, since the beginning of the Iraq War and Afghanistan War, uh, that the VA mission has, has changed drastically. Uh, also, uh, what has impacted their mission is the huge number of World War II and Korean veterans, Korean War veterans, uh, who are now in their 80s and uh, for the first time in their lives are requiring, on, requiring care from the VA system. Uh, he provides uh, statistics here for the Department of uh, Veterans Affairs where they have shown a 29.9 percent increase in that time frame during the two wars. And uh, that is a result of the 2008 VA bill that we all passed that was the largest VA appropriations bill in the 77-year history of the VA. And we did that because we, recommend, we, we recognized and acknowledged the need. And uh, I think that the gentleman's amendment uh, speaks right to that priority that we all recognize. That bill went through uh, nearly unanimously, I think. Uh, the House and Senate, and uh, w was uh, long overdue. So I think that I, I speak in support of the gentleman's amendment. 
And uh, I think it's consistent with the, the priorities not only of this Congress, but of the American people. And I would, go back. would my friend from Kentucky further yield? I will yield to my friend from Virginia. I uh, thank my friend. Um, I, I also support the amendment, but I do think it further underscores we could have a series of such amendments, all of which probably philosophically would agree with in terms of the mission. So we could have an amendment like this that instead of talking about veterans, we could talk about senior citizens, or we could talk about the disabled population in America, or we could talk about law enforcement agencies with a particular uh, bent of, with respect to drug, uh, drug addiction or drug enforcement, uh, or you know, violent crime, or there are lots of exemptions we might all want to agree to, because the problem is, uh, with this kind of limitation, carve-outs are necessary. So I yield back to my friend from Kentucky. Thank you. I, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. The question now occurs on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Yarmuth. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, nay. In the opinion of the chairs, the noes have it. The noes have it. The amendment is not agreed I to. I ask for yeas and nays, Mr. Chairman. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Issa? No. Mr. Issa votes no. Mr. Burton? Mr. Micah? Mr. Platts? Mr. Platts votes no. Mr. Turner? Mr. McHenry? Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan votes no. Mr. Chaffetz? Mr. Chaffetz votes no. Mr. Mack? Mr. Wahlberg? Mr. Lankford? Mr. Lankford votes no. Mr. Amash? Ms. Burkle? Ms. Burkle votes no. Dr. Gosar? Dr. Gosar votes no. Mr. Labrador? Mr. Meehan? Mr. Meehan votes no. Mr. Desjardins? Mr. Desjardins votes no. Mr. Walsh? Mr. Gallaty? Mr. Ross? Mr. Ginta? No. Mr. Ginta votes no. Mr. Farenthold? No. Mr. Farenthold votes no. Mr. Kelly? No. Mr. Kelly votes no. Mr. Cummings? Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Towns? Mrs. Maloney? Ms. Norton? Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Kucinich? Mr. Tierney? Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Clay? Mr. Lynch? Mr. Lynch votes aye. Mr. Cooper? Mr. Connolly? Aye. Mr. Connolly votes aye. Mr. Quigley? Mr. Davis? Mr. Davis votes aye. Mr. Braley? Mr. Welch? Mr. Yarmouth? Mr. Yarmouth votes aye. Mr. Murphy? Ms. Spear? Ms. Spear votes aye. The clerk will report. Mr. Towns? Uh, On the vote, Mr. Chairman, there are ele uh, 12 no's, 8 ayes. Uh, uh, how was the gentleman recorded? Mr. Towns, you are not recorded. Yes. Mr. Towns votes aye. Nine. The, clerk, the clerk will report. 9 ayes, 12 no's. The amendment is not agreed to. Uh, at this time, we will call back up the amendment offered by the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. And I, uh, at this time, I have a second degree amendment. The clerk will read the amendment. Do we have it? Second degree amendment to the amendment offered by Mr. Cummings of Maryland to H.R. 3029, offered by Mr. Issa of California. The chair recognizes himself to explain the amendment. I believe that. Uh, the gentleman from Maryland has offered a thoughtful amendment. My secondary amendment simply uh, seeks to make it consistent with what I believe is our joint effort, uh, particularly uh, striking each agency in the gentleman's amendment and changing it to the Office of Management Budget. I believe that the Office of Management Budget is designated both by government-wide and by our bill to be the determinant of the regulations and the like. Uh, we believe that, uh, that this is, a, as, as amended, or if an amendment is accepted, a bipartisan uh, change to the bill and would urge its acceptance and yield to the gentleman from uh, Maryland. Th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, um, I, I agree with you. This, um, the amendment to the amendment is, um, it makes, it makes the amendment better, and so, therefore, we would accept the amendment. 
the amendment to the amendment. I thank the gentleman. Could I ask a question about the I yield to the gentlelady from the District of Columbia. I thank the chairman for, for the change which, which uh, uh, brought us all together. Uh, uh, this, this does not mean that the, the uh, Office of Management Budget would not be reporting by agency, does it? I mean, no, not at all, uh, uh, reclaiming my time. It is simply uh, because in our bill and, and government wide, we recognize that OMB is who we look to for it. Rather than having, the indi agent is, is right, the rather than having individual agencies report, we felt it was significant to consolidate it as we ordinarily would under OMB. Mr. Chairman, I think this uh, routinely, when we pass legislation that is uh, important, we ask for reports back so we will know what happened. So I think this is very appropriate. Thank I you. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Yielding back with that, the question occurs on the amendment to the amendment, or second to your amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Opinion is chair. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question now occurs on the Cummings amendment as amended. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Are there any further amendments? The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized for the purpose of offering an amendment. I thank the Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe I have an amendment in the nature of a substitute at the desk. The clerk will amendment. read the amendment. In the nature of a substitute to H.R. 3029, offered by Mr. Lynch of Massachusetts. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Uh, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I notice my clock is at two minutes and 50 seconds. I wonder if we have all been so efficient that we've, <laughs> we are all working on each other's time right okay. now, but the gentleman is now recognized for a uh, we said it one more time, for a full I, five minutes. I, I thank the Chairman. I appreciate that. I thought maybe you were discounting for some of the extra time I took last time I spoke. Uh, uh, you know, the gentleman would, would uh, suspend. The, uh, the fact is we have a problem here, which is folks from the North talk quickly, folks from the South a little slower, and we try to balance it, and you are from the North. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this, this amendment, in the nature of a substitute, would uh, uh, in part, acknowledge the goal of, of a 10 percent reduction uh, in the Federal workforce. That definition ex is expanded to include not only the 2 million Federal employees that we have, but also the 10.5 million contractors that we have. And if we are really interested in reducing the deficit, if we are really interested in, in uh, balancing the budget at some point, then we have got to look at that 10.5 million uh, workforce that we have out there under contract. As a matter of fact, we have difficulty, uh, at least uh, uh, some of our oversight agencies have difficulty in knowing just exactly how many folks are out there. Uh, as the Chairman noted before, we are withdrawing troops from, from Iraq at, at, a, at an accelerated pace. However, we are uh, having greater reliance on, on individual contractors to perform some of the functions that our Federal employees were, were performing previously. Uh, this, also, this amendment also gives discretion to the President. Instead of the across-the-board uh, cuts that we are we're anticipating in this, the underlying legislation, the President would be able to look at uh, the constitutional mandate that the agencies have, the statutory functions that, that these agencies perform. And uh, we talked earlier about the fact that the VA is meeting a huge mission change because of uh, the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, and also the aging World War II population, the aging uh, Korean War population that has put tremendous pressure on the VA. Uh, this also would uh, give credit by including the Postal Service uh, for the reductions that we hope to achieve through the early retirement system uh, uh, program that is being uh, considered right now in, in the Senate and will be at some point, I imagine, uh, considered here in the House uh, that might put as many as 120,000 postal employees into retirement, dignified retirement. Uh, and so there is a broader definition of employee. The goals are out there. Uh, and, and I think it is a much more respectful and thoughtful way of getting these numbers down. Would my colleague yield for a question? Certainly. I yield I, to the gentleman from North Virginia. If I am uh, looking at uh, page 3, uh, number 3 at the top, it looks like what you are proposing here is uh, a, a, an additional cut of Federal contractors over and above 
a 10 percent reduction of the number of Federal employees? No, that is not the intent of the legislation. And I will, you know, if, if that is the gentleman's uh, understanding, let me just say that is not the intent. Uh, this was redrafted uh, in, in the back, and so uh, it is a 10 percent total. What we are trying to do is to, is to capture uh, that massive population of 10.5 million contractors right. and not simply focus on the 2 million uh, Federal employees, uh, many of whom are, are performing a, you know, under a constitutional mandate on behalf of the American people. I thank my colleague. Thank you. So it would be a, an aggregate uh, 10 percent reduction. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, that is the, that's the object of, of this uh, legislation. It acknowledges the need to reduce the workforce, uh, but tries to do so in a, in a way that is, uh, I think, uh, respectful of, of our, our constitutional and, and statutory responsibilities. It gives great, great uh, uh, discretion to the President in terms of his reductions. If you remember back in 2009, the President announced that he would reduce the contractor funding and the number of contractors on the payroll by $40 billion uh, going forward from, from that point. Uh, I am not sure that we have achieved those goals yet, but uh, this is certainly something that is in harmony with the President's intent. So, Does the gentleman yield back? I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The distinguished Former Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. Burton, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Lynch is a good friend of mine, and uh, I hope he doesn't take any of my comments personally. But uh, the President uh, seems to be uh, making executive decisions on his own uh, and uh, indicating that uh, he doesn't really need Congress. And I am very reluctant to vote for anything that would give him any authority beyond what he has already tried to take. We are a co-equal branch of government, and uh, the President uh, should be consulting with Congress and working with Congress. And I understand that we are at loggerheads on a number of issues, but that doesn't change the Constitution. And uh, we are the legislative branch, and he is supposed to work with us. And so. Uh, uh, that is one reason why I uh, w oppose this uh, amendment. The second one is, today uh, the President of Greece, the Prime Minister of Greece, res is resigning. And he is resigning because that country is in one hell of a mess. And uh, uh, they, people over there, I, just, I was in Greece about two weeks ago, they are taking 40 percent pay cuts, 40 percent pay cuts. The people who are retired are taking 40 percent cuts in their retirement. And the United States is heading in the same direction that Greece is in right now. And unless we get control of spending, we are going to face the kind of problems that they are facing. And I can tell you that I, I know the Federal workforce doesn't want to see pay cuts of 30 or 40 percent like in Greece, but that is where you head when you don't get control of spending. And so the whole purpose of this bill is to start reducing the Federal workforce so we can cut the spending. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and although Mr. Lynch, my good friend, is very well-intentioned, uh, I think this is an amendment that we ought to, uh, ought to defeat. And with that, I yield back the balance. Would the gentleman yield? I will be happy to yield to my colleague. I thank the gentleman. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. I, I think your, your comments were right on. Uh, additionally, upon evaluating this piece of uh, amendment uh, to the legislation, it I don't want to say it is disingenuous. I know the gentleman is sincere. But since we have already passed out of this committee, and a formal attrition bill, a, a postal reform bill that in its current form would, over this 10-year period, and by the way, over the postmaster's uh, anticipated 10-year uh, period, would reduce the entire 10 percent the attrition bill uh, d desires to meet, meaning by including postal workers in this definition, you will, in fact, achieve it, even if there is not one reduction in anywhere but the post office. And I know the gentleman doesn't mean that, but any consideration of an amendment like this would require that we, uh, uh, that we adjust the number to, to reflect the, at least the anticipated attrition that is in the postal system, which over 10 years is at least 200,000. As the gentleman knows, we have been losing about 30,000 per year out of the post office through ordinary attrition. I would, Will the gentleman yield? Of course. Yeah. 
let me just say the gentleman is correct that that is a significant drawdown. We are anticipating that 120,000 postal employees will take the early retirement. That does not meet the government-wide uh, uh, requirement in the underlying bill for a 10 percent across the board government reduction. However, if you look at what we are doing in Iraq and what we are trying to do in Afghanistan, and you look at NASA, where uh, the funding has been greatly reduced there, and a number of other agencies, uh, again, I am not sure if, if the, the chairman ruled on my request to submit uh, the Federal Workforce Characteristics and Trends by Curtis Copeland uh, from the CRS, but I, I again, I repeat my request to have this entered into the record by With, unanimous consent. Without objection, okay, thank all, you. All, all, this will be admitted and all other extraneous material uh, requested by members of this sort will be admitted. Uh, does the gentleman request further time from the gentleman from Indiana? Yeah, yes, I, I would. Uh, and if you look at, look, he has a listing of all the agencies, uh, A to Z, and, uh, and lists whether or not that agency's population, uh, workforce has, uh, has grown or shrunk. And you do have uh, the folks at Treasury uh, have, have greatly reduced their, their uh, workforce, the Department of State. Of course, what you don't pick up with State is that uh, while they have reduced their own workforce, the number of contractors working for the State Department has in increased exponentially. So uh, that is why I am trying to get at that number by including the number of contractors. But uh, uh, it, would, it would take a lot of work for us to meet that 10 percent uh, guideline, and this is no, not intended, uh, my bill is not intended to sort of uh, double count reductions that we already have in the pipeline. Uh, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the Chair would announce that this and all future uh, votes are intended to be uh, rolled to a time specific pursuant to the committee rules. Uh, with that, the question occurs on the, uh, I'm sorry, I just announced it. Okay. Uh, there are no further amendments. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, with that, the question occurs on uh, the amendment from the gentleman from Massachusetts. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, nay. No. no. In the opinion of the chairs, the noes have it. The noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I have another amendment at the desk. The clerk will read the amendment. Uh, do you have a number on that? I think it's two. I, we have it. The clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 3029, offered by Mr. Lynch of Massachusetts. A gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a very simple amendment. Uh, this amendment would uh, seek to achieve a 10 percent reduction in the contractor workforce, as I said before. Uh, we, we are focused on the 2 million Federal employees in the underlying bill, but we completely ignore the 10.5 million contractors that are out there that are also drawing tremendously from, from the budget and from the taxpayers. So uh, this, this amendment would add uh, contractors uh, to the uh, goal of uh, the 10 percent reduction. And uh, because of the 10.5 million, it would have a much more dramatic beneficial effect on the bottom line uh, for our budget. And so that is the, the intent of this, uh, this amendment. The gentleman yields. And I yield. I want to thank the gentleman for yielding. Um, I uh, thank the gentleman for this uh, very thoughtful amendment. Dramatic reductions in the Federal workforce often result in major <laughs> increases in the use of Federal contractors. For example, in the 1990s, dramatic reductions in the Federal workforce were followed by huge increases in the contractor workforce. When a decrease in Federal workers is met with an increase in even more expensive contractors, none of the anticipated savings are achieved. The underlying legislation requires a cost comparison before a service contractor is hired. However, it may be difficult to, to, to do a true cost comparison of a service contract. According to GAO, it is, is often difficult to control and facilitate accountability in service contracts because definitive requirements do not exist at the outset of the contracts. This amendment would repair this deficiency in the underlying bill and put hiring limitations on service contractors in line with the limitations on Federal workers. As a result, this amendment will help control costs and benefit the American taxpayers. For all these reasons, 
I support the amendment and urge its adoptions and would yield back to the, the gentleman. Thank you. Reclaiming my time, and I appreciate the kind words of the ranking member, and I thank him for his, for his support. Uh, I just want to call out in that, in the, uh, the report by Curtis Copeland of the Congressional Research Service at, uh, at page 3, he notes that between the years 1999 and 2005, the estimated number of Federal contract jobs increased by more than 70 percent, from more than 4.4 million to more than 7.6 million. I think a lot of this uh, uh, reflects the, the, the Bush administration policy to shift, and, and, and uh, Secretary Rumsfeld's policy to shift from using Federal personnel to, to contractors. And so that is a 70 percent increase in, in six years in the contractor workforce, and that is that is what this amendment is trying to get at. I have two minutes left. Uh, I yield to the gentleman from Northern Virginia. I thank my friend. Um, unfortunately, um, I, uh, I rise uh, in opposition to the amendment. Uh, while I have enormous Reclaiming my time. <laughs> 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 kidding. I am kidding. Uh, no, I thank my friend from Massachusetts. Uh, to be consistent, I think arbitrary caps whether they be on Federal employees or Federal contractors, is wrong. And I think it potentially has enormous disruption. I, my friend talked about the Wounded Warrior Program. Uh, many of the Wounded Warriors coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan have to have outside advisors and advocates to help them through the medical system. Many of them have to uh, seek legal counsel. All of them are encouraged to have legal counsel. But sometimes the resources of JAG are stretched too thin and they actually have to hire outside counsel who are paid for by the Federal Government. And so I, I just think the potential for disruption uh, is there. And, while, and, and again, there is implicit in this a value judgment that outsourcing is bad and insourcing is good. And I don't view this theologically. It is a matter of practicality and what makes sense and the efficiencies and so forth. And so reluctantly, while I certainly understand the intent of my good friend trying to strike a better balance in the underlying bill that is so flawed to be consistent, I reluctantly will have to um, vote against this amendment. And I yield back to my friend from Massachusetts and thank him for his uh, graciousness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. I recognize myself. Uh, I would like to start with a question. Would, did the gentleman in his amendment intend to uh, include the same presidential waiver authority uh, that exists for uh, Federal workers? As I, I recall, the in the underlying bill, there were waivers for emergency, there were waivers for efficiency. I, and, and the, I wouldn't, why I I wouldn't be hostile. I don't know if that's in my, my amendment, uh, the, but my staff, I wouldn't be hostile to that. Yeah, my, my staff, uh, reclaiming my time, my staff indicates that in its current form, it would not provide the same protections uh, for the President to waive those reductions, which could, as you, you noted, could be 55 percent of service contracts. So uh, although the Chair is uh, very favorably uh, willing to include the amendment, uh, language would have to be agreed to, uh, if, if you will, technical language in this colloquy, colloquy to cause that amendment to be so covered. I, I, that would be a friendly amendment. I would, I would certainly agree to that. Okay. Then, uh, since we are rolling votes till the end, uh, that language will be uh, prepared and agreed to by the end of the day, or we will reopen uh, for final, uh, you know, the bill for final vote. But uh, we are prepared to accept the amendment if it has that, because uh, obviously we want the President to have the ability to make considerations, as the gentleman from Virginia noted, uh, for essential services, constitutional responsibility and the like. Okay. I thank the Chairman for his, his reasonableness. Appreciate that. Okay. With that, the, uh, the question. Can we call the Okay. With that, the Chair would announce, uh, or would ask you to consent to suspend further debate on this bill until that can be, uh, on this amendment until that can be uh, written. Are there any other amendments to uh, the underlying bill? Seeing no others, we will suspend the final vote on this bill and uh, until that amendment can be uh, prepared. Parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman. 
this gentleman will say his parliamentary inquiry. Uh, just a quick question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, any idea when we might have votes? Uh, you indicated that you want to roll them. Uh, some of us have to juggle other committee schedules. Just wondering. I appreciate the gentleman reclaiming my time. We, uh, we will. Uh, we will have a vote uh, of following the amendments on whistleblower, uh, because at that point I believe we will be able to quickly dispense with the remaining bills. So I can't tell you how long whistleblower will take, but as we near the end of the whistleblower amendments, I would expect that we will have the technical corrections for Mr. Lynch's amendment and be prepared to go into final. Uh, at a minimum, I will observe, if there is no other pre-notice, I will observe the equivalent of the bells ringing, uh, meaning the 15 minutes from the time uh, that we tell both staffs that we are going to vote until the time in which the vote will occur. I thank the Chair. Thank you. And having suspended the previous bill, the committee will now uh, consider House Resolution 3289, the Whistleblower Protection Enhan Enhancement Act of 2011, and I recognize myself for an opening statement. As I said, and I will be brief, as I said earlier today, this is, in fact, an example of the majority and minority working for a very long time to get it right. Uh, no bill is perfect, and I suspect that other committees of the Congress will find it necessary to make comment on our, our bill. However, as the primary responsible committee of the Congress for protecting whistleblowers and ensuring that integrity within government is maintained, we take it very serious that exposing waste, fraud and abuse, mismanagement and criminal activity across the Federal Government is, in fact, long overdue to have a facelift. All those here today will note that this bill exempts no part of government, although we provide protections to ensure that sources and methods uh, are not disclosed. It is well recognized that simply adding a classified uh, to a document or some other activity should not prohibit, prohibit whistleblowers from coming forward. Additionally, I want to give uh, credit where it is absolutely due. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Platts, and the gentleman from Maryland, former member of this committee, Chris Van Hollen, have in fact worked tirelessly for seven years, have offered substantially similar bills time and time again. Their efforts and their co-sponsorship uh, and their ability to, uh, to help modify this bill to get it right is not just appreciated, but was essential. Over the years, whistleblowers have been critical to government. Today, more than ever, we need to improve that ability. Lastly, it is the intention of this committee to recognize that a whistleblower who is a Federal employee is not enough. The truth is that, as both sides of the aisle have mentioned today, America has 2,200,000 Federal workers, but we have 10,000 Federal contractors. We have, in fact, far more need to ensure that wrongdoing, waste, fraud and abuse, and a plethora of other failures of government need to also have the support of contractors. It is the intention of this bill to take us a long way down the road toward whistleblowers being protected at all levels of participation in government. We don't know that we will get it right on, and perfect on the first time, and that is the reason uh, for a two-year pilot, but we know we must get it right. It is the intention of this Chair and this Ranking Member, if I may speak for him, to ensure that within a year we are well of signing, we are well along our way toward making sure that this program, including contractors, progresses, is evaluated, and long before reauthorization is due, it is my intention with the ranking member in whatever role we find ourselves in at that time, along with Mr. Van Hollen and Mr. Platts and other interested parties, to make sure that we extend permanently the kinds of whistleblower protection 
throughout the Federal workforce, whether they are, in fact, Federal employees or employees employed through contracts by the Federal uh, Government. And with that, I would, uh, I would yield to Mr. the Ranking Member, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am very pleased and encouraged that our committee is uh, marking up the whistleblower uh, legislation. I completely agree with the Chairman that uh, this bill, H.R. 3289, will significantly expand protections available to government whistleblowers who risk their careers to challenge abuses of power and the man mismanagement of government resources. This journey has been long and frustrating for advocates of whistleblower protections who have been trying for nearly a decade to get a strong bill enacted. At a time when the American taxpayers expect government to be more accountable and prudent with their resources, we must not wait any longer to ensure that we are getting the best value for every dollar we spend. Although the bill before us is not the most exhaustive package of reforms, it addresses a host of gaps in the protections afforded to Federal whistleblowers today. For example, the bill clarifies that disclosures of any violation of law rule or regulation are covered under the Whistleblower Protection Act. This will correct misguided court rulings that limit when whistleblower disclosures are protected. Under this bill, a whistleblower will be able to bring an action to a Federal court if the Merit Systems Protection Board fails to act, a significant improvement over current law. The bill also ensures that transportation security officers receive full protection and it extends limited whistleblower protections to employees in the intelligence and national security communities. At my urging, the bill also contains a pilot program that will afford whistleblower protections to civilian agency contract employees. I have been working with the Chairman on this provision, and I think we can continue to, to, continue to improve it as we proceed. Mr. Chairman, I would also like to yield uh, to, to you on this, uh, but as I understand our discussions, if this pilot program can be implemented successfully. It is your intention to make it permanent in the future. Is, is, that, um, is my understanding correct, Mr. Chairman? Would the gentleman yield? Yes, of course. I, uh, I not only intend to, but as we have uh, spoken uh, often, within a year we expect to have the report back. Within a year I look forward to a early reauthorization that would extend this at a minimum to be permanent to prime contractors and to seek ways to push down to subcontractors so that we can cover as much of that entire 10.5 million workforce that today, prior to this uh, law being passed, are not currently covered and would pledge to do that with the gentleman. Thank you very much for reclaiming my time. And I really thank you for that, Mr. Chairman. And let me emphasize that this legislation has a long bipartisan history on our committee. Our committee supported similar legislation on a bipartisan basis for the last eight years. In fact, the House of Representatives passed similar bills twice. In 2007, a bipartisan measure received 331 votes. In 2009, a bipartisan legislation passed on a voice vote. I agree with the Chairman that the real thanks today must go to Congressman Todd Platts. Uh, the chairman of our subcommittee on government organization, and Congressman uh, Chris Van Hollen from my state, Maryland, a distinguished member and former member of, of uh, this committee. Over many years, they have diligently championed this legislation, and they have worked behind the scenes to find a truly bipartisan way forward. In fact, Congressman Platts has personally sponsored whistleblower legislation since 2003 and fought for these issues with a passion. It is only because of their dedication and leadership sustained over many years that we are here today with this bill, which has been endorsed by over a dozen open government organizations. In the spirit of bipartisanship, Mr. Chairman, let me close with a simple request, but a very sincere request. I ask unanimous consent that the title of H.R. 3289 be amended to be called the Platts Van Hollen Whistleblower Protection Act of 2011. Without whistleblowers and the uh, unfiltered information they provide, uh, the oversight and investigative functions of Congress would be seriously compromised. I am encouraged that we are finally considering this measure today. And I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your, uh, the way that you have handled this bill, uh, just in a tremendous spirit of bipartisanship. And I think the people of our great country will benefit from what we are doing. Uh, with that, I yield back. 
I thank the gentleman. I now recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania for an opening statement on a bill that is so similar to what he has done for so many years. Is, could you respond? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am pleased to uh, join with you, Ranking Member Cummings and Representative Van Howen, in introducing the legislation we are considering here today. Uh, as you referenced and the Ranking Member referenced, I first became involved in the issue of whistleblower protections a good many years ago when I introduced the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act as H.R. 3281 in 2004. Would the gentleman yield? Uh, I would be glad to. It is most appropriate that I respond to an earlier request for a unanimous consent. And I ask unanimous, or I, unanimous consent request was made that H.R. 3289 be amended to be called the Platts von Hollen Whistleblower Protection Act of 2001, and without objection, that is so ordered. I, I certainly Platts, don't object. I, I didn't think you would. You're not, you're, I thank you for yielding. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I thank you and the ranking member for uh, for recognizing um, Representative Van Hollen and, and me for our work on this issue. Um, that original bill that I introduced um, got a voice vote in committee, but was not considered uh, in the full House. Uh, I reintroduced it the next session, and again, we passed it out of committee with the even stronger protections. Uh, Representative Van Howen and I offered the text of that bill as an amendment on the House floor in 2009, which the full United States House representatives, representatives adopted by voice vote. Uh, I was pleased to join with Congressman Waxman and Van Howen in sponsoring other variations of the bill in 2007 and 2009, as I am today pleased to join with you, Ranking Member Cummings and Congressman Van Howen, in sponsoring this bill. The Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act will strengthen the inadequate protections currently afforded to Federal employees who report illegalities, gross mismanagement and waste, and substantial and specific dangers to the public health and safety. To provide context, it is important to review the legislative history in the area of whistleblower protections for Federal employees. As a result of findings that the civil service protections at the time were inadequate, Congress in the first Bush administration enacted into law the Whistleblower Protection Act, WPA, of 1989, which expressly stated that, quote, any, unquote, protected disclosure of certain categories of waste, fraud and abuse by a Federal employee is covered by the law. Unfortunately, as interpreted by the Merit Systems Protection Board and the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, loopholes began to develop in the WPA. Accordingly, Congress strengthened the law in 1994. It is noteworthy that the report accompanying the WPA amendments of 1994 expressed great frustration with the way the WPA was being interpreted. According to the report, perhaps the most in troubling precedents involving the Board's inability to understand that any means any. The WPA protects any disclosure evidencing a reasonable belief of specified misconduct, a cornerstone to which the MSPB remains blind. The only restrictions are for classified information or material, the release of which is specifically prohibited by statute. Employees must disclose that type of information through confidential channels to maintain protection. Otherwise, there are no exceptions. Unfortunately, we are once again largely back to where we started. Since the 1994 amendments, 219 whistleblowers' cases have come before the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals. However, only three whistleblowers have prevailed. Among the reasons are a number of decisions which have created exceptions to the law, including decisions stating that an employee is not protected by the WPA if the employee directs criticism to a supervisor in an attempt to start the process of challenging misconduct, the information disclosed has already been raised by someone else, or the information disclosed was done in the course of the employee's ordinary duties. In addition, the Federal Circuit Court of Appeal at one point even stated that for a Federal employee to reasonably believe there is evidence of waste, fraud and abuse as required by the law, he or she must overcome with irrefragable proof the presumption that the agency was acting in good faith. This is an unheard of legal standard defined in the dictionary as, quote, impossible to refute, unquote. With the enactment of the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act we are considering here today, there should no longer be any uncertainty. The Act would overturn the court and administrative decisions that undermine existing whistleblower protections. Other significant reforms included in the legislation before us granting, um, include granting employees access to Federal court under certain circumstances if the Merit Systems Protection Board does not take action within 270 days, allowing certain precedent-setting cases 
to be reviewed by the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit instead of the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals and strengthening the procedures in place for investigations of whistleblower complaints related to national security matters. In conclusion, I want to extend my thanks to all members and committee staff who have worked on this issue over the past seven years, as well as numerous good government organizations, such as the Government Accountability Project and the Project on Government Oversight. The most recent changes to the bill will hopefully broaden its appeal sufficiently for enactment into law. I also would like to thank those Federal employees who have the courage to come forward and report waste, fraud, and abuse. With the fiscal challenges currently facing the country, we need such courage like never before. Uh, again, I am honored uh, by the uh, offered amendment by the ranking member and, Mr. Chairman, your acceptance of that. I uh, certainly look forward with uh, Representative Van Hollen to continue working with you and the ranking member and all of our colleagues to do right by America's taxpayers, by America, and protect those who come forward and re report fraud, waste, and abuse. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the bill has already been opened and already been amended. Uh, uh, so I just realized that that amendment will take effect after <laughs> this. Uh, the clerk, uh, let me go. We will now open the bill H.R. 3289 for consideration without objection. H.R. 3289 will be considered as read and open for amendment at any time. The text has already been distributed and is in your fo folder. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 3289, a uh -huh. bill to amend Title V, United States Code, to provide clarification relating to disclosures of information protected from prohibited personnel practices, to require a statement in nondisclosure policies, forms, and agreements that such policies, forms, and agreements are in conformance with certain protections, to provide certain Ask Ask unanimous consent to be considered as read without objection. Would the uh, ranking member offer his amendment one more time, please? Just the unanimous consent. I ask unanimous consent that the uh, bill be named the Platts Van Allen Whistleblower Bill. Without objection, that text will be added to the, uh, the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Are there any further amendments? Oh, the gentlelady is recognized to speak on the bill. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to speak on the bill. Uh, and I thank um, uh, Mr. Platts, Mr. Van Hollen, you, Mr. Chairman, and our own ranking member for this bill. And the reason I want to speak on this bill is because um, not only in 1994, uh, where with the amendments to which uh, that have already been uh, described here, but ever since the Whistleblower Protection Act was passed uh, initially. Uh, this act has been a deterrent to employees to come forward because the chances of prevailing are close to zero. Uh, and Congress over and over again has tried through amendments to correct this because there has been a long bipartisan, long tradition of bipartisan support for, for, for whistleblower protection. I, I am assuming, because as I look at parts of the bill, that we are, we are correcting uh, much in the bill that has been used, and the word used is, I think, the right word here to defeat uh, whistleblower protections. For example, that if uh, what you disclose is, quote, already a part of your duties, of your job duties, well, that is not whistleblower protection, no matter how, uh, uh, how difficult it would be under the circumstances to report uh, the particular matter, no matter if it has never been reported before. This has been a favorite uh, provision. Uh, whether you are talking about the MSBP or uh, the courts, you see the same astonishing refusal to enforce this law as uh, Congress intended. I think it is very salutary that we have added uh, and national security and intelligence uh, protections, and that we have added contractor protections. And the reason I think the addition of contractor protections is, is, is called for here is that contractors ought to be doing work that Federal employees uh, cannot do, or, or, or for, for one reason or the other, uh, are not doing. Therefore, there would be nobody 
uh, to blow the whistle, as it were, if contractors uh, are indeed not uh, given uh, this protection. <laughs> in, the, in the age of WikiLeaks, I would hate to wake up one day and find out that that is where we learned uh, of some whistleblower matters that our own employees would have come forward uh, to inform us about uh, and believe that uh, we are getting, moving forward at least, to informing the courts uh, and the MSVP that we want them to do what we say do, and that is to uh, recognize that when somebody has the courage to come forward, uh, that ought to be recognized, and we no should not use legal technicalities to defeat congressional intent in the Whistleblower Protection Act. And I thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, is there anyone else who wishes to speak on, uh, strike the last word before we take amendments? Seeing none, uh, the clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 3289, offered by Mr. Tierney of Massachusetts. Recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you. I, I want to first thank the Chairman for reintroducing uh, this important legislation to protect whistleblowers and thank as well all of the uh, co authors of the bill and those that have been persistently. Uh, pushing this concept for so many years, Mr. Platts uh, and uh, Mr. Van Holland and others. Protecting those that seek to bring to light waste, fraud and mismanagement of taxpayer money and government resources is critical to increasing the efficiency of the Federal Government. This is particularly important within the military and the intelligence community, as funding in those areas is often classified, making whistleblowers our best hope of uncovering waste, fraud and abuse in these, in these areas. As currently written, the bill covers disclosures made by whistleblowers in the intelligence community only to the Director of National Intelligence or to the head of the whistleblower's agency. My amendment would ensure that disclosure made to a supervisor in the chain of authority is also protected, provided that the supervisor is legally authorized to access the disclosed information. Mr. Chairman, the decision to come forth with information on abuses and mismanagement of taxpayer funds can be a difficult one. That is why I want to be certain that potential whistleblowers are made to feel as comfortable and confident as possible when they make the decision to disclose possible malfeasance. Requiring whistleblowers to schedule appointments with the Director of National Intelligence or the head of their agency can be intimidating and can add unnecessary stress to that decision. Employees in all of government and all of business generally are always more familiar and more comfortable with direct superiors than the heads of their agencies or organizations. I would also note that many members of the intelligence community have military backgrounds and respect for the chain of command is of paramount importance to current and former military service members. It is my understanding that there is some concern with my amendment among some in the intelligence community, because whistleblowers in the intelligence and military area may not always know whether their superiors may legally have access to the information the whistleblower wishes to disclose. However, the amendment would not prohibit the whistleblower from going to the Director of National Intelligence or the head of the agency as an underlying legislation provides for that if there is some doubt or some question on it. So the amendment merely provides another avenue for whistleblowers to pursue, one they may be more comfortable with than making an appointment with the Director of National Intelligence or their respective agency. For all those reasons, I ask members to support this amendment and yield back my Would time. the gentleman yield? Certainly. Uh, the Chair is prepared to accept the amendment, uh, both of us having served, and I believe you are still currently a HPSI member. Uh, the only thing that I would say is that this bill will perhaps or likely be sequentially referred and uh, I would hope that uh, you can continue uh, expressing the importance of this amendment. We believe that it is appropriate uh, for what you and I know goes on behind closed doors in the intelligence community. Reclaiming my time, I have the unfortunate news that I am currently on leave this session, but uh, may well go back next session. But, uh, well, you, we but, have but you didn't go through the veil of forgetfulness, I trust. <laughs> no, I mean, we do have to impose on the members of the intelligence committee. Both the Chairman and I are aware of uh, how inured they are sometimes to the intelligence community and, and a need to be independent and uh, look at this with a, with a broader view. Well, as a fellow former member of the committee or on leave, as we like to say, uh, we are prepared to accept it. Does anyone would, else? Would the gentleman time? yield? I guess he still has time. He still has time. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, I want to thank uh, Mr. Chairman for offering the amendment, and I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for accepting it. Um, I too want to go back to Mr. Turney and thank him for all his hard work in this area. Um, this is a this is a, a, a common sense amendment. Uh, under this amendment, an employee in the intelligence community would be protected for blowing the whistle to a supervisor, but only if the supervisor is authorized to have access to the information disclosed. 
Uh, the bill we are considering today covers only disclosures by intelligence community employees that are made to the director of the National Intelligence, of National Intelligence or the head of an employee's agency. It is not often that Federal employees have contact with the director of national uh, intelligence. This amendment will help ensure that potential whistleblowers are not intimidated into silence because they are afraid to go all the way up to the top. This amendment provides an appropriate outlet for whistleblowers without compromising the security of information. I urge the committee to adopt it, and again, I thank the Chairman for accepting it. And with that, I yield back to the gentleman. The question now occurs on the Mr. Chairman, if I could, if I could a brief statement on the the gentleman is recognized. Uh, just also would like to thank the gentleman for, for offering the amendment. Um, we often, when we talk about whistleblowers, it's about protecting against the waste of tax dollars and you know fraud and abuse in that sense. But there certainly is also the importance about protecting the safety of Americans. And in this uh, area that you're addressing, uh, it may be about re, um, whistleblowers coming forward to report misconduct that is about that safety issue. So all the more it is important, and I, I think it further strengthens the bill and appreciate and offer it and certainly support it. Yield back. The question now occurs on the amendment offered from the gentleman, by the gentleman from Massachusetts. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The chair, uh, in the opinion of the chair, the, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The gentleman from the First District of Iowa is recognized for the purpose of offering an amendment. Mr. Braley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment is very simple. It the clerk will read the amendment. HR, uh, I'm sorry, amendment to HR 3289 offered by Mr. Braley of Iowa. The gentleman is recognized for purposes of explaining his amendment. Thank you. The amendment that I offer is very simple. It restores language that was passed unanimously by this committee on March 9th of 2007. It was adopted by the House on March 14th of 2007 by a vote of 331 to 94, and it was passed unanimously by the House in the last Congress. It simply gives either party to a proceeding the ability to request a trial by jury. And, Mr. Chairman, I think it is important to point out that I am offering this amendment in the spirit of the Tea Party both the original Tea Party and the Tea Party rallies that bring their copies of the Constitution to the Capitol and hold them up. The Tea Party originally began as a response to the abusive practices of King George, leading to the writing of the Declaration of Independence by Thomas Jefferson. And the original Tea Party was a response to taxation without representation. In the Declaration of Independence, right after writing, among the grievances that were being raised against King George for imposing taxes on us without our consent, Thomas Jefferson included this grievance for depriving us of the benefits of trial by jury. This right was so important that it became embedded in the Seventh Amendment to the Bill of Rights, which preserved the right to trial by jury in civil cases. And it seems to me fitting and fair that in a, in a remedy designed to protect the rights of people who put their careers on the line, that we give them the option of allowing the very people who vote for us and send us to Congress to make decisions on questions of fact on whether their rights have been violated. And because this has been endorsed by groups as diverse as the American Federation of Government Employees, the Government Accountability Project, and the National Taxpayers Union, because it has been endorsed by whistleblower advocacy groups and because it is such a central right embedded in our Nation's history, it seems fitting that we restore this provision to the bill. And that is why I ask all the members to support my amendment. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman. I recognize myself in opposition to the amendment. The Braley Amendment would give Federal employee whistleblowers access to trials by jury for the first time. This would be a bonanza for the plaintiff's trial lawyer bar. Additionally, although I share perhaps more with the Tea Party than even my gentleman friend from Iowa, the recognition that the administrative process does work, the recognition that there are numerous protections in the bill, including the underlying legislation, which increases whistleblowers' access to the United States District Court in the event that the Merit System Protection Board, the MSPB, 
cannot dispose of the case within 270 days, or if the case has multiple claims and requires complex or extensive discovery arising out of the same acts uh, or set of facts as any civil action against the government or involves a novel question of law. I know the gentleman is a knowledgeable attorney and recognizes that that is a relatively expansive set of opportunities for individuals to, uh, to seek those remedies. Would the gentleman um, yield? I will in just a moment. Additionally, we in Congress always know that the idea is to pass a piece of legislation that becomes law. It is the Chair's opinion that were we to allow this provision, it would kill the bill. It would kill the bill because of known objections within the Judiciary Committee, and in fact, it would deny whistleblowers the protection that we are adding while trying to get one more level for a relatively small group of whistleblowers that might seek that or their representatives on the bar. Uh, with that, I would yield to the gentleman from Iowa. Well, I appreciate your comments, Mr. Chairman. I am surprised, though, because this is the identical language that came out of committee when you served on it in 2007. There were no objections when it was voted on in committee. It went to the floor, the exact same language in this bill, passed overwhelmingly by the House. I believe you voted for that, Mr. Chairman. And when it passed a year ago with the exact same language in it, you also voted for that. So I am surprised by the sudden change in your attitude toward giving people a right that is enshrined in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Reclaiming my time, uh, the gentleman is correct on each of those points. Uh, and what one, one member of this committee would support, uh, if my information is correct, the former chairman of the Judiciary Committee waived a referral meaning that the Judiciary Committee did not have such an opportunity. That will not be the case in this Congress. And there are serious concerns about expanding without the kinds of controls that are in the underlying bill access uh, to our Federal court system. For that reason, I do oppose the gentleman's uh, amendment, and I would hope that he would recognize that getting a really great bipartisan bill that might not have everything that we could have had is more important than getting it out. Now, I would agree with the gentleman that you might get it out of the House, but that would only be, first of all, if it got to the floor, uh, and second of all, uh, we still have the problem that this bill, under Mr. Platt's and Mr. Van Hollen's uh, leadership, Congress after Congress after Congress failed, and I repeat, failed to make law. We want to make law. With this inclusion, I don't believe we would successfully make law. And I know that the gentlemen and the whistleblowers who depend on us uh, to make these changes would like us to make law. You're, the gentleman certainly welcome uh, the day this becomes law to file a new bill that would further amend it, and I would strongly encourage him to do so. But I do want to get past what we can get past is a on a bipartisan basis through all the committees of Congress, including Judiciary and including uh, the Select Intelligence Com Committee. If you seek time. And I yield to the ranking member. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I um, listened to your comments. I think you probably have a, a very good point. We do want a bill, and hopefully, uh, perhaps uh, we can have some conversations, uh, Mr. Braley, with the folks on judiciary, and see if we can't get past that that hurdle. Um, I want to take a moment to express my strong support for the amendment being offered by our colleague from Iowa. For centuries, the opportunity to have a, a case heard by a jury of your peers has been one of the most fundamental elements of our judicial system, and I am glad you agree with that, Mr. Chairman, and I, and I do understand what you are saying. Our founding fathers understood the importance of jury trials versus bench trials and have yet to hear, I've yet to hear one good reason why we should depart from this tradition when it comes to Federal workers and contractors who blow the whistle on waste fraud and gross mismanagement in government. Providing whistleblowers a jury trial will provide an important check and balance to the Merit System Protection Board's powers if it fails to accurately interpret complex Federal personnel policies or enhancements to the Whistleblower Protection Act. Part of the reason why we are going through the, the whole legislative uh, exercise of making improvements to the Whistleblower Protection Act is to create a more fair and balanced system that encourages the disclosure of waste, wasteful and harmful government behavior. 
Unfortunately, the bench trial only approach in the underlying bill may actually discourage whistleblowing, which I doubt is the intent of the bill's sponsors. But again, the Chairman's um, concerns are, are do, do, I mean, without a doubt, we need to recognize them. By providing a, access to jury trials for a small fraction of whistleblower cases in which the uh, MSPB cannot come to a decision in a timely manner, uh, we will ensure greater parity between these types of cases and all other modern whistleblower and discrimination laws in which jury trials are utilized. For example, jury trials are the norm in all 11 whistleblower laws passed since 2002, including the Energy Policy Act for Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the Department of Energy employees. The right to jury trials also has been available since 1991 for the equal employment opportunity cases. It makes both legal and common sense to extend this due process right to Federal whistleblower retaliation cases as well. Although I appreciate uh, that H.R. 3289 grants petitioners access to the district courts under certain limited circumstances, the bill will be greatly strengthened by including the right to have whistleblower-related uh, cases tried by a jury. The gentleman's amendment is simple, straightforward, and mirrors language that is included in the Senate version of the Whistleblower Protection Enactment Act, which was passed out of committee last month. I would also like to point out that the amendment as drafted is completely balanced as it gives both plaintiffs and defendants the right to seek a jury trial if so desired. In closing, government whistleblowers uh, assist us in reducing fraud, waste, and abuse, and should not be treated like second-class citizens by only having a one-size-fits-all alternative means to the MSPB administrative process. I support the Bailey Amendment to allow for the opinion of jury trials in whistleblower retaliation cases, and I urge my colleagues to support it. And again, uh, I would hope that we would try to uh, work with the judiciary and see if we can get them to perhaps take another look at this since we all seem to have pretty much agreement on the way we think the bill should be. Um, and whether we are successful or not is one thing, but at least I think it is worth a try. And with that, I yield back. With that, we recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Meehan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we are dealing here with a very delicate area. I think, first and foremost, that, that, that none of us wants to create the kind of an impediment to the whistleblowers who perform a very valuable service. I had the opportunity as a United States attorney to work with individuals who had the courage to come forward and identify waste, fraud, and abuse. And there have been significant accomplishments on behalf of, of, of the taxpayers and on behalf of our, our, our nation by virtue of those who at times have had the courage to come forward. Um, there is a delicate area, however, and, and I think that we need to appreciate something in this process. Because while there are courageous whistleblowers that will come through, uh, we also have to deal with the reality. Um, there are individuals as well within any employment situation, uh, and that includes the Federal Government, who become experts on the ability to use every window and opportunity to, to, to promote their own uh, particular attempt to protect themselves from uh, uh, appropriate accountability and oversight. What I mean is there are people who will abuse process. They will, in the midst of being held accountable for their performance or lack thereof, identify circumstances in which they will suggest it is a retaliation because they have been whistleblowers. Uh, it is a fine area, uh, but I do believe that we see abuse of process uh, as a real potential in certain circumstances. What we are doing is not allowing those professionals, first and foremost within the MSPB, who, who are seasoned and understand the right balance. Uh, in addition, uh, what we begin to see in what are very crowded courtrooms in the Federal court system. The idea that we do not have the confidence in a Federal judge to be dispassionate and to be able to make an evaluation, I think, underestimates the capacity and capability. My own experience is that you will see Federal judges 
go overboard to create the opportunity to have every legitimate window for an aggrieved person to have access to the courts, but they also appreciate where abuse of process takes place, and there are circumstances under which it is clear that an abuse of process is taking place, and judges must have the capacity to be able to control the, the flow of legitimate issues within the courts. And I think we take away from the Federal Judiciary and the Protection Board the ability to use discretion. My own sense is, by the time it gets to the courts, these matters are well vetted. The record speaks to itself, and we must rely on their judgment. That is why we appoint them. This creates the ability to create an automatic right to a jury trial outside of the ability of the judge to use that discretion opens up the window for further abuse of process in those unique cases where that is the aim of somebody who is otherwise trying to avoid accountability. And I think that I am hoping that what can be done is this delicate area can somehow be resolved within the context of work that is done uh, outside of uh, this amendment. And I, I therefore hope that the gentleman will consider uh, some kind of ability for all of us to work to address it, but still appreciate the need for the courts to be able to police the appropriate activity within the courts. Would the gentleman yield? Mm -hmm. yeah, my my time has expired. Uh, no, the, ge the gentleman has an additional 53 seconds if he wishes okay. to yield. I, I, yes, I will yield. Well, I, I'm getting the impression that you're contending that in any case where a right to trial by jury is provided, that that creates an environment where abusive process can occur. And already in the Federal court system, there is a rule of procedure called Rule 11 that it gives Federal judges the ability to sanction parties and their counsel who engage in abusive practices in the Federal courts. There are also private remedies for abusive process and malicious prosecution, as well as sanctions that can be entered to prohibit this type of behavior. So the only thing that this amendment does is reinstate language in this bill that has been there since 2007 that gives people the same basic right that they have under the Constitution. And I don't see how that is giving rise to an abusive process. Well, the gentleman. It's your time. Okay. Well, uh, I, I reclaim my time then. But I, I think the gentleman does appreciate the Rule 11 and the fact that that remedy is there, uh, but also within the conduct of the courts that that becomes oftentimes a significant remedy for a judge to use, and how many times those kinds of things are raised but resolved within, again, the discretion of the judge. And I think we, to, to expect that every one of these cases could only be resolved and then put the burden on a judge instead of being able to use appropriate discretion based on the record, the requirement that their resolution of this is to rule against an attorney on a Rule 11 uh, and a plaintiff, I think, is, is asking more of the system, and it will only mm -hmm. complicate it even further from the points that uh, I had made. Okay. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from California has been very patient and is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am under the impression that the Senate version of the bill has the right to a jury trial in it. Right. So the extent to which this is a bipartisan um, interest here, my hope is, is that when the bill gets this to the House floor, maybe an amendment can be offered that would um, place it in um, a parallel track with that of the Senate version. Uh, if the gentlelady yeah. would yield. I do. Uh, as we understand it, the Senate version will not go to the floor with that exact language. Uh, and I would note that our current bill if unamended, would be conferenceable to come up with some middle ground if, if, in fact, they do bring it that way. But the gentlelady is correct. If, we, if this were to uh, be different than the Senate bill, it would be conferenceable. Currently, it is our understanding that, that the Senate will move it with, without that particular provision. And if the gentlelady would further yield, I might note something, which is that although it is not explicit in the bill, at least the Chair has no objection to recognizing that if a cause of action allows for a jury trial with a particular whistleblower for any of a plethora of other reasons, we find no limitation, nor would we want to seek one, that would keep this issue from being included. 
And uh, the gentlelady and I came not from the Federal court system, uh, but I have been informed that the vast majority of whistleblower cases and the vast majority of cases that are not primarily whistleblower will often include the two. And that is one of the reasons that seeking to add whistleblower as a specific get you into a trial is a concern. Well, in fact, if you have, let's say, an EEOC claim and a whistleblower claim and you are in a trial, there is no reason that it wouldn't be dispensed at the same trial. So that is one of the challenges we are facing is that technically you can claim to be a whistleblower and thus get into a jury trial when, in fact, your other claims may or may not give you a jury trial. So this is one of the reasons that that taking this out of the bill makes it much easier to pass a bill today and then treat any additional modification uh, on its own merits. And I thank the gentlelady for yielding. Would the gentlelady yield? I yield. Well, Mr. Chairman, I have actually been in that very situation. And I have I, your, your legendary uh, work as a plaintiff's trial lawyer. We're, no, we're I, I'm just telling you that I know exactly what happens in that situation, is that Federal judges have the discretion to decide whether to treat the jury as an advisory panel for the purpose of making fact findings required in a non-jury claim. So this doesn't provide an automatic right to have those claims tried by a jury, and a Federal judge could exercise discretion and choose not to use the jury to make findings of fact on the whistleblower claim. And that's why it's important to include the basic fundamental right included in both the Declaration of Independence and the Seventh Amendment to the Constitution in this important public policy interest of giving protection to employees who have been penalized because of blowing the whistle and doing something of benefit to U.S. taxpayers. And I will yield back. I thank the gentleman. Does the lady, gentlelady yield back? I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. With that, the question occurs on the amendment. And the gentleman from Iowa, all those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Aye. In the opinion of the chairs, the noes have it. The noes have it. The uh, yeas and nays are, are ordered uh, pursuant to the earlier, uh, earlier uh, order. They will be rolled or postponed. Hold on a second. Are there any further amendments? The gentlelady from California is heard twice in a row. Uh, do you have an amendment? I do, Mr. Chairman. The clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 3289, offered by Ms. Beer of California. The gentlelady is recognized to state her amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you, and thank you for promoting this uh, bipartisan bill. This amendment is quite simple. It calls on the GAO to study the current practices of agency whistleblower hotlines. When I was in the State Legislature in California, uh, I put in place a whistleblower hotline that um, was a great tool to those of us who had oversight responsibilities in the State for rooting out waste, fraud and abuse. What we have found on the Federal level, however, is that there are plenty of anecdotes of hotlines uh, lacking qualified personnel, not answering the telephone during published work hours, and whistleblower complaints getting back to personnel they blew the whistle on. A new study by GAO is necessary to confirm the full scope of current weaknesses at the Federal agency hotlines and to recommend uniform best practices so that Federal agencies have appropriate channels to report fraud, waste and abuse uh, and match the standards for corporate hotlines. It is interesting to note that a study in 2007 by the Association of Certified Fraud Auditors found that hotlines at U.S publicly traded corporations led to more exposure and detection of internal corporate fraud than auditors, compliance departments, and law enforcement combined. So we have uh, an example with publicly traded corporations where the use of hotlines have been very, very effective, and the Federal Government should have a system equally as affected. And so this study will give us that needed information to create a much stronger hotline system. And with that, I yield back. Does the gentleman yield? I do. Mr. Chairman, I would like to express my support for the amendment being offered by the gentlelady from California and certainly hope that the majority is inclined to accept this amendment. The amendment is straightforward. It would require the Comptroller General 
of the United States to conduct a study to examine the existing whistleblower hotlines of all Federal agencies. These hotlines play an important role in providing employees a readily available avenue to disclose information about government waste, fraud, and abuse, and gross mismanagement, which could potentially lead to greater government efficiencies and save the American taxpayer millions, if not billions, of dollars. Since this amendment seeks to assess the current usefulness of the hotlines and find ways to improve them in order to enhance their effectiveness, I fully support the amendment. I urge the adoption of the gentlelady's amendment, and I yield back to the gentlelady. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I have concluded my comments. The gentlelady yields back. Uh, does any other member wish to be uh, speak on the amendment? Uh, seeing none, uh, the Chair is prepared to accept the amendment and uh, support it. Um, all those who are in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. If there are no further amendments, the question is on the postponement of the uh, amendment offered by Mr. Braley. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Issa, Mr. Burton, Mr. Micah, Mr. Platts, Mr. Platts votes aye, Mr. Turner, Mr. McHenry, Mr. Jordan, Mr. Jordan votes aye, Mr. Chaffetz, Mr. Mack, Mr. Wahlberg, Mr. Wahlberg votes no, Mr. Langford. Mr. Amash, Mr. Amash votes no. Ms. Burkle, Ms. Burkle votes aye. Mr. Gosar, Mr. Gosar votes aye. Mr. Labrador, Mr. Meehan, Mr. Meehan votes no. Mr. Desjardins, Mr. Desjardins votes aye. Mr. Walsh, Mr. Walsh votes no. Mr. Gowdy, Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross votes no. Mr. Ginta? No. Mr. Ginta votes no. Mr. Farenthold? No. Mr. Farenthold votes no. Mr. Kelly? No. Mr. Kelly votes no. Mr. Cummings? No. Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Towns? Mrs. Maloney? Aye. Mrs. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Uh, Ms. Norton? Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Kucinich? Mr. Tierney? Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Clay? Aye. Mr. Clay votes aye. Mr. Lynch? Mr. Cooper? Mr. Connolly? Mr. Quigley? Aye. Mr. Quigley votes aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mr. Davis votes aye. Mr. Braley? Yes. Mr. Braley votes aye. Mr. Welch? Mr. Yarmouth? Mr. Yarmouth votes aye. Mr. Murphy? Ms. Spear? Ms. Spear votes aye. How, are, how is the chair recorded? The chair is not recorded. I vote no. Mr. Issa votes no. Uh, you are not? Mr. Uh, Burton? Uh, Micah, I'm sorry, votes no. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Chaffetz? Mr. Chaffetz votes no. Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan votes no. The other Mr. Burton? <laughs> Mr. Jordan votes no. Thank you. Mr. Burton votes no. How Mr. Labrador? I am a lot better looking than either one of them, but I am no. <laughs> Mr. Labrador votes no. Ms. Burkle? No, I would like to change my vote to no, please. Ms. Burkle votes no. Mr. Gosar votes no. You are recorded as an aye. Mr. Desjardins votes no. Mr. Gowdy? Mr. Gowdy votes no. Mr. Langford? 
Yeah, Mr. Langford is a no. Uh, Mr. McHenry, Mr. Lynch, Mr. Lynch votes aye. Does anyone else wish to add or change their vote? Mr. Connolly. Connolly. Yes. Mr. Connolly votes aye. Mr. McHenry. Mr. McHenry votes no. Does anyone else wish to be heard? The clerk will report. Uh, Mr. Walsh, is, is Mr. Walsh recorded? Yes. Thank you. Clerk will report. Uh, on that vote, Mr. Chairman, 13 ayes, 20 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. The question now occurs on. The question now, if there is no further discussion, I move the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report the bill, H.R. 3289, to the House with the recommendation that the bill do pass. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the Chair, the, chair, the ayes have it, the ayes have it. The bill is, uh, the clerk, uh, the clerk is, will call the roll. Mr. Issa. Aye. Mr. Issa votes aye. Mr. Burton. Aye. Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Micah. Mr. Platts. Mr. Platts votes aye. Mr. Turner. Mr. McHenry. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan votes aye. Mr. Chaffetz. Mr. Chaffetz votes aye. Mr. Mack. Mr. Wahlberg. Mr. Wahlberg votes aye. Mr. Langford. Mr. Langford votes aye. Mr. Amash. Mr. Amash votes aye. Ms. Burkle. Ms. Burkle votes aye. Mr. Gosar. Mr. Gosar votes aye. Mr. Labrador. Mr. Labrador votes aye. Mr. Meehan. Mr. Meehan votes aye. Mr. Desjardins. Mr. Desjardins votes aye. Mr. Walsh. Mr. Walsh votes aye. Mr. Gowdy. Mr. Gowdy votes aye. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross votes aye. Mr. Ginta. Mr. Ginta votes aye. Mr. Farenthold. Aye. Mr. Farenthold votes aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Mr. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Cummings. Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Towns. Ms. Maloney. Ms. Maloney votes aye. Ms. Norton. Mr. Kucinich. Aye. Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Tierney. Aye. Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Clay. Aye. Mr. Clay votes aye. Mr. Lynch. Mr. Cooper. Mr. Connolly. Aye. Mr. Connolly votes aye. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mr. Davis votes aye. Mr. Davis, I mean, Mr. Quigley, I didn't hear you. Mr. Quigley votes aye. Mr. Braley. Mr. Braley votes aye. Mr. Welch. Mr. Yarmouth. Mr. Yarmouth votes aye. Mr. Murphy. Ms. Beer. Ms. Beer votes aye. Ms. Norton, you are not recorded. Ms. Uh, Norton votes aye. Mr. Mr. Lynch. Uh, McHenry. Mr. Chairman, have I been recorded? Aye. Mr. Lynch. Mr. Aye. Mr. Lynch votes aye. Mr. McHenry votes aye. Mr. Micah, you are not recorded. Mr. Micah votes aye. Don't go away, Mr. Micah Burton. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? You are not recorded, sir. Uh, aye. Mr. Cooper votes aye. Does anyone else wish to add or change their vote? The clerk will report. On the vote, Mr. Chairman, there are 35 ayes. And 35 ayes and no noes. I was waiting for the okay. Then 
by unanimous vote the bill is agreed to, I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make necessary conforming and technical changes to the bill, without objection so ordered. Uh, We now resume consideration of H.R. 3029. The pending business is the Lynch Amendment, second degree. And see, I have a second degree amendment at the desk to the Lynch Amendment. Uh, all those in favor of the, it's already been read, hasn't it? No, it hasn't. The clerk will, the clerk will read the amendment. The, it's the ISA Amendment to the Lynch Amendment. Amendment to H.R. 3029 offered by Mr. Lynch of Massachusetts, ISA, to the Lynch Amendment of H.R. 3029. I recognize myself and yield to the gentleman from Massachusetts uh, for any comment he has on the amendment. No, no. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your, uh, your edits are, uh, and your, your further amendment is certainly a friendly one and uh, is an improvement on the original amendment. So. Uh, I just want to thank you, and, and I appreciate your, your uh, corrections here and additions, and I support your, your amendment to uh, the underlying amendment. Reclaiming my time, and with that, I want to thank you for working diligently to, uh, for us to get a good amendment that improves the overall bill, and ultimately, that is what you have contributed today, and I thank you. Okay. If no one else wishes to speak on the amendment. Uh, all those in favor of the secondary am amendment to the Lynch Amendment say aye. aye. Opposed? In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The amendment to the amendment is agreed to. We now consider the uh, Lynch Amendment as amended. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. If there is no further discussion, I move the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report the bill, H.R. 3029, to the House with the recommendation that it do pass. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed signify by saying no. No. In the opinion of the chairs, Chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The bill is agreed to. The, the Chair, I'm oh, sorry, the uh, a, a recorded vote is, is, is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Issa? Aye. Mr. Issa votes aye. Mr. Burton? Aye. Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Micah? Aye. Mr. Platts? Aye. Mr. Platts votes aye. Mr. Turner? Mr. McHenry? Aye. Mr. McHenry votes aye. Mr. Jordan? Mr. Jordan votes aye. Mr. Chaffetz? Aye. Mr. Chaffetz votes aye. Mr. Mack? Aye. Mr. Mack votes aye. Mr. Wahlberg? Aye. Mr. Wahlberg votes aye. Mr. Langford? Aye. Mr. Langford votes aye. Mr. Amash? Mr. Amash votes aye. Ms. Burkle? Mr. Burkle votes aye. Mr. Gosar? Mr. Gosar votes aye. Mr. Labrador? Mr. Labrador votes aye. Mr. Meehan? Mr. Meehan votes aye. Mr. Desjardins? Mr. Desjardins votes aye. Mr. Walsh? Mr. Walsh votes aye. Mr. Gowdy? Mr. Gowdy votes aye. Mr. Ross? Mr. Ross votes aye. Mr. Ginta? Mr. Ginta votes aye. Mr. Farenthold? Aye. Mr. Farenthold votes aye. Mr. Kelly? Mr. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Cummings? Mr. Cummings votes no. Mr. Towns? Mr. Towns votes no. Ms. Maloney? Ms. Maloney votes no. Ms. Norton? Mr. Uh, Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Kucinich? Mr. Tierney? Mr. Tierney votes no. Mr. Clay? Mr. Clay votes no. Mr. Lynch? Mr. Lynch votes no. Mr. Cooper? Aye. Mr. Cooper votes aye. Mr. Connolly? No. Mr. Connolly votes no. Mr. Quigley? Mr. Quigley votes no. Mr. Davis? Mr. Davis votes no. Mr. Braley? I'm sorry. Mr. Braley votes no. Mr. Welch. Mr. Yarmouth. Mr. Yarmouth votes no. Mr. Murphy. Ms. Spear. Ms. Spear votes no. Mr. Mike, I do not have you recorded. Mr. Mike votes aye. Mr. Kucinich. You are not. Mr. Kucinich votes no. Does anyone else wish to add or change their vote? The clerk will report.
on that vote, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 14 ayes, 23 noes. Would you, the clerk, recount? Move that the vote be closed. <laughs> <laughs> How many times did Mr. Connolly get to vote on this? 23 ayes, 14 noes. Do both clerks agree on the count? Yes, all three of us do. All three. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. H.R. 3029 is ordered reported to the House. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make necessary conforming and technical changes to the bill without objection so ordered. I now recognize myself for unanimous consent. I ask unanimous consent that to the extent it does not change the outcome of the vote, the record, the record shall reflect the votes of members who were not recorded but whose votes would have been cast as follows, Mr. Yarmouth and Mr. Uh, Braley uh, uh, to H.R. 3289. And wait a second. on the Yarmouth Amendment, which would be Mr. Braley and the Braley Amendment. Wait a second. There we go. Uh, let me restate. I ask unanimous consent to the extent it does not change the outcome of the vote. The record shall reflect votes of members who were not able to cast a vote on the Yarmouth Amendment to H.R. 3029 and the Braley Amendment to H.R. 3289 and uh, reporting H.R. 3289, without objection so ordered. The gentleman from uh, you we, seek recognition? Well, I'm only for clarification now. Um, I mean, I, was I included in that? Uh, all members would be included in those uh, votes. Uh, to, for clarification, the Chair had the routine of this committee is, in fact, to roll votes uh, on two occasions, uh, although it wouldn't change the outcome. Members counted on that rolled vote, and their votes need to be properly recorded pursuant to uh, the agreement that we had for rolled votes. So, yes, you would be included. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the Chair would further advise members if they believe they were not recorded. Uh, pursuant to that unanimous consent, they may seek from the, uh, the clerk the information necessary to ensure they are properly recorded so long as it not, does not change the outcome. And with that, the committee We're skipping ahead. With that, the committee will now consider H.R. 3262, the Government Results Transparency Act, and I recognize myself. Uh, for a quick opening statement, uh, actually, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to waive an opening statement and recognize Mr. Gunter for to make the opening statement on his bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this bill is a very straightforward uh, bill, essentially focusing on performance and transparency, uh, which is part of the oversight's, uh, our committee's oversight of broader effect to achieve a full government transparency through better technology. Uh, this is uh, attached to or in addition to your bill, uh, Mr. Chairman, the, that you proposed earlier this year in June called the Data Act, which will establish a single public website for all Federal spending information. My piece of legislation simply adds performance data to that website. Uh, and the reason for that is no existing law requires program by program performance data to be tracked against program by program spending. Data. I think that is important and critical to make sure we are efficient and effective and to allow taxpayers and Americans one central location to find and identify the performance and expenditures of programs. So with that, I ask for a favorable consideration and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Maryland for his opening statement. Mr. Chairman, I strongly believe that the committee should pursue efforts to make government more transparent. I would like for us to work together to develop legislation that will appropriately expand government transparency wherever possible. However, this bill is not uh, what I envision. I appreciate that the intent of the bill is to make agency performance information more transparent. 
What this bill actually does, however, is to duplicate existing law and add a layer of inefficiency burden and red tape without producing a clear benefit. The Government Performance and Results Act requires agencies to submit information about the performance of agency programs to OMB. The GPRA Modernization Act, which came out of this committee and was enacted in January, already requires OMB to maintain a single website that is updated quarterly with information about performance of agency programs with data detailing how much money is being spent on those programs. Under this bill, however, agencies would have to submit the same performance data to both OMB and the Recovery Accountability and Transparency, uh, Transparency Board. OMB would make the information available online, and the RAT Board would uh, be required to make the same information available online. I appreciate the desire to make the information transparent. I do not uh, plan to vote against this bill, however. Uh, I hope that uh, as this bill moves forward, the Chairman will work with me to try to figure out a more efficient way to expand the availability of government uh, performance information. I yield back. I thank the gentleman, and I would like to work with the gentleman on any of these uh, improvements. Uh, thank you. I will, uh, I will hold the record open until the end of the day to have any members who would like to submit written statements. Uh, we will now open the bill, H.R. 3262, for consideration. Without objection, H.R. 3262 will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The text has already been distributed to each member in their folders. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 3262, a bill to amend Title 31, United States Code, to increase government transparency. Does any member wish to speak on the bill? Seeing none. Uh, if there is no further discussion, I move the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report the bill, H.R. 3262, to the House with the recommendation that it do pass. All those in favor uh, say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, H.R. 3262 is ordered reported to the House. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make necessary and conforming technical changes to the bill. Without objection, so ordered. The Committee will now consider H.R. 3237, the SOAR Technical Corrections Act. I recognize myself for an opening statement. Earlier this year, the, 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 uh, uh, the House passed a reauthorization to strengthen the D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program, which was included as part of the Department of Defense. Uh, and full year continuing re appropriations resolution. Although this is not a unanimously agreed to uh, piece of legislation, uh, the general lady from the District of Columbia and the committee on both sides have worked together to ensure that these technical corrections allow the true intent to be occurred. And with that, I would recognize the general lady from the District of Columbia. Uh, I, I agree with your statement, Mr. Chairman. This makes no substantive change in the bill. They are technical corrections, uh, and I have no objection to, to the bill. I thank the gentlelady. Does anyone else wish to speak on the bill? Hearing none, uh, I, will, I will hold the record open. Oh, wait a second. Yeah. Uh, I would like to hold the record open until the end of the day for members who would like to submit additional written statements. We will now open the bill, H.R. 3237, for consideration. Without objection, H.R. 3237 will, is open for amendment at any point. The text has already been distributed to each of the members in their folders. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 3237, a bill to amend the SOAR Act by clarifying the scope of coverage of the Act. Uh, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 3237, offered by Mr. Issa. Uh, I recognize myself to br speak briefly on it. The amendment simply, uh, since the original drafting of the bill, does uh, add some additional technical corrections, and I believe the gentlelady from the District of Columbia and her staff have already seen them, and that uh, this, is part of, this is to be included as part of the mutually agreed package. With that, I would recognize the gentlelady from the District of Columbia if she has any questions.
That's what I thought I was voting on before, and these just look like uh, uh, even even um, <laughs> more. It, it, it looks like uh, uh, ordinary correction. Right. The, the general lady is correct. In, in the ordinary course, we probably would have simply included this under the unanimous consent. But since they agreed to it last night, they put it up for me now. Uh, reclaiming my time. Uh, I think we have a. If there's any question, I certainly would. No problem. No problem, Mr. Chair. If there are no further members wishing, seeking recognition, and the question is on agreeing to the amendment, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Uh, okay. Does any uh, member wish to add an additional amendment? Hearing none, if there is no further discussion, I move the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report the bill, H.R. 3237, as amended to the House with the recommendation it do pass. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it, the ayes have it. H.R. 3237, as amended, is ordered reported to the House. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make necessary and conforming changes to the bill, without objection so ordered. The committee will now consider H.R. 2297, a bill to promote the development of the Southwest Waterfront uh, in the District of Columbia and for other purposes. Without objection, I discharge the Subcommittee on Health Care, District of Columbia, Census and National Archives from consideration of H.R. 3237, and I recognize myself for an opening statement. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the gentlelady from the uh, District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, for introducing this legislation and that will help develop the southwest waterfront of the District of Columbia in an area of the city just a short distance from here. The legislation allows waterfront area to be leased or sold to private sector development. This will enable the district to advance the implementation of a major redevelopment plan. I would also like to thank Ms. Norton for working in an open fashion throughout the process to ensure the language of her amendment accomplishes its purpose. I support the amendment, I support the underlying bill, and I encourage all of my colleagues to do the same. And with that, I would recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Chairman, I, I uh, support the, uh, the bill, and I would yield to Ms. Norton. Uh, I, I, thank, I thank the gentleman for yield, yielding. I thank uh, the chairman. Uh, and I thank uh, you, Mr. Cummings, for working with me on, on this bill. Uh, I associate myself with the remarks of uh, Chairman Issa. Uh, this is another technical bill. This land is already owned by the District of Columbia. But because it was transferred after, before home rule, it contains some, some uh, uh, encumbrances that would not have been there if the district had, had been an independent uh, jurisdiction. Uh, already, and of course, does not allow the highest and best use of the property. The federal government didn't have any interest in it in the first place, which is why it it transferred it and has no interest uh, at this time. It's non-controversial bill that simply removes out-of-date provisions, pre-home rule out-of-date provisions, involves no cost whatsoever uh, to the district uh, government. Um, and at, at the same time, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I'd like to say that I have a manager's amendment that makes uh, additional technical corrections, but they are drafting errors and simplifying uh, other provisions having to do with the fish market. And I do want to say that I work with uh, Senator Susan Collins, who was concerned about the Maine lobster uh, 
Lobster Man Memorial. And uh, we have worked out an agreement between the District of Columbia and the Park Service to preserve that memorial uh, and any memorials on the property. Uh, with that, I thank you both, Mr. Chairman, especially you for working to get this bill through at this time. The gentleman yields back. I will hold the record open until the end of the day for any member who wishes to make a written statement. We will now open the bill, H.R. 2297, for consideration. Without objection, H.R. 2297 will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The text has already been distributed to each of the members in their folders. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 2297, a bill to promote the development of the southwest waterfront in the District of Columbia and for other purposes. I thank you. Does any additional member wish to speak on the bill? Seeing none. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the gentlelady from the District of Columbia is recognized for the purpose of offering an amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> I indicated during my uh, The open clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 2297 offered by Ms. Norton. The gentlelady is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I indicated during my own remarks, the uh, manager's amendment simply makes uh, corrections, uh, <clears throat> drafting corrections to the bill uh, and deals with other technical matters in uh, the bill and, like the bill itself, uh, does not have uh, any substantive import beyond uh, the agreement I have reached with Senator Susan Collins to protect the Maine Lobster Man Memorial. I thank you. Would the gentlelady Chairman. yield? I would be glad to yield, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Chair is prepared to accept the amendment, and I personally want to thank you for taking advantage of this opportunity to, uh, to expand the bill to include another important issue for the people of Maine. Uh, this kind of efficiency is appreciated, I think, uh, both here and on the House floor. I yield back. I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Does any other member wish to speak on the bill? If there is no further discussion, I move the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report the bill, H.R. 2297, as, amend as amended to the House with the recommendation to do pass. Wait a second here. I am sorry, we didn't, we didn't vote. I apologize. Uh, it is not in the talking points. But all, the question now occurs on the Norton Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. Opinion of the Chair. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The Norton Amendment is agreed to. If there is no further discussion, I move the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report the bill, H.R. 2297, as amended to the House with the recommendation to do pass. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, nay. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. H.R. 2297, as amended, is ordered reported to the House. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make necessary and conforming technical changes to the bill without objection so ordered. I now ask unanimous consent to discharge the Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce, the United States Postal Service and Labor Policy from consideration as necessary uh, to the bill's uh, and favor I'm sorry, and favorably report consideration and favorably report to the House HR two nine eight, HR two zero seven nine, HR twenty one fifty eight, HR twenty four fifteen, HR twenty two or twenty four twenty two, HR twenty six sixty, HR twenty seven sixty seven, HR three thousand and four, H.R. 3220, H.R. 3246, H.R. 3247, H.R. 3248. Does any member wish to end and Senate 1412? We went well into the next page. Does any member wish to speak on the bills? Yes. The gentleman from uh, Maryland is recognized. Mr. Chairman, um, did you make your comments? I, I settled for the unanimous consent, but I, I recognize the gentleman for these noncontroversial and, and important uh, namings. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I uh, support uh, all of these namings. I think they're named after they've been vetted and named after people who richly deserve it. And um, with that, uh, I support the bills. I thank the gentleman, and I, and I might note that the vast majority of these are named for fallen, fallen heroes in the various wars we're engaged in. Uh, does anyone else wish to speak on the bills? If not, 
the, uh, unanimous, without objection, the unanimous consent is so ordered. The committee stands adjourned.